When did you move to Los Angeles? I moved to Los Angeles in 1996. And why? Um, I had shot a low budget independent film with some friends of mine in New Jersey. They they actually already lived in Los Angeles. Uh, they were people I'd gone to school with, film school with. So they one of them came back to New Jersey, we shot the movie, and then we came to Los Angeles to edit it because another friend of mine was working in a post house and he could get us on the Avids, like you know, after hours at night. Uh, and it was only supposed to be for six months was, you know, was the plan. So I came here with like maybe three grand, you know, and like, and I, you know, and I crashed on sofas and it ended up taking, of course, years, you know, so I, I got, had to get a job and, you know, the years went by. And by the time we finished the movie, I, you know, had a whole life out here at that point. So I said, well, I guess I live in Los Angeles now. So that was uh, how I ended up here. What was your reality like after a couple of years? Hmm, that's a tough one. I, I would say it was probably pretty normal, pretty average. I mean, I, uh, I, I, I got a job at a small production company and I started out as a talent manager's assistant. And from that position, I sort of, you know, worked my way through that company. I don't know if I worked, I don't know if I'd say I worked my way up, but I worked my way to other positions, you know, in that company. And I eventually wound up being uh, in charge of all the camera equipment, production equipment on a TV show that they launched called uh, Blind Date, which was very successful for them and went on for many years. And I worked with them for, I'd say, like five or six years uh, on that show. Uh, and that kind of led to other, you know, other jobs and other career opportunities and things, but mostly on the behind the scenes side versus the creative side. So, you know, while that was always going on, I was always in the background, you know, writing or trying to come up with ideas and stuff like that, but most of my work was more technical. And so did you see how if you got like a regular job on, you know, reality TV or whatever, you could make a very good living, but maybe some of the creativity wouldn't be? Absolutely. In fact, I would say I, I could have, I think a, a big part of it is like believing yourself and like, you know, putting yourself out there because looking back, I'm sure I could have had more creative opportunities if I'd reached for them, but I think I wasn't, I don't think my confidence was super high at that time. Um, I do know guys that started off as, you know, PAs and went on to become segment producers or story producers. Um, so I, I think absolutely, if someone wants to get into the business, like just, you know, you have to get your foot in the door somehow. So it's take, you know, find a PA job, find an assistant job, just get started. You know, you never know who you're going to meet or where it's going to lead you. And I couldn't have predicted even the path that I took would not have seemed obvious to me at the beginning, you know, so. But then I think you had a, a I don't know if you if get busy living or get busy oh. dying. Sorry, <laughs> oh, let me, you must have read one of my let me, interviews. Let me read it. Yeah. <laughs> that came, that actually came much later. You know, I mean, I was out here for many years before that. And I think that's kind of what I mean when I say, uh, I, I, I don't think, I think, I, I think everything that I ended up achieving, I probably could have achieved about 10 years earlier than I did if I had been more uh, confident and if I'd, you know, trusted in myself and most importantly, not allowed myself to get discouraged. Uh, and I think, you know, you hear this a lot that it's obviously it's a tough business and there's going to always be more no's than yeses. But I think it's, um, you just have to really understand that and prepare for it and just keep you know, keep plugging away, keep trying, keep working on your own things and not, don't be shy about putting yourself out there. Because I, I think uh, that moment you're talking about came many years later, but it could have come sooner, you know, in my opinion, when I look back on my life. Do you think it was confidence or playing it safe? Probably both, you know, a little of both. Um, I mean, what happened with me was I think I allowed myself to get uh, discouraged early on because I had, uh, like I said, we had made this independent film we moved out here, we finished it. Um, and the film turned out, you know, for what it was, it turned out okay. We did sell it actually, which is rare, but we certainly didn't make a lot of money off of it. Um, not, you know, we weren't, uh, we couldn't stop working. You know, it was a very small deal. Uh, but it, the next thing I worked on was a screenplay for a, uh, a horror movie that, you know, in my dream at the time, which I, to me seemed like a very modest dream. I'm sure it isn't, but you know, I really wanted to work with Roger Corman. He was a hero of mine. And uh, I lo always loved B movies and monster movies and horror movies, those kinds of things. And so I had written this script. It was a kind of a retro 50s uh, giant bug movie kind of thing. And it was optioned by producers working with Roger Corman. And I was, you know, 
on top of the world. I mean, I, I was like, this is it. Like, this is the way it's meant to be. You know, like, like it's happening. And of course, it, you know, it ended up just not working out. I mean, I don't, who knows? I think, I think Roger at that time had some deal with some German financing that fell through. And, you know, I, I never actually met him in person or anything like that. It was just through these producers working with him. And that project just, you know, went away like most projects do. And I think because I had, it, because it seemed so perfect and so exactly what I wanted when it didn't happen, I think that just took kind of took the wind out of my sails for a while. And it was a long time before I really started putting myself out there creatively after that. And that was a mistake. You know, I should have just kept at it. I was reading, actually read a, uh, a Japanese proverb last night that stood out to me. If you, uh, if you get knocked down eight times, pick yourself up nine. And I think that is the way this business works for sure. Do you know how to say it in Japanese? No. Oh, I, was say, <laughs> I speak oh, I a tiny it. bit of Japanese, okay. but not, not very much. <laughs> okay. What kind of job were you working when you started writing Tokyo Black? And can you tell us about your get busy living or get busy dying moment? Sure. I mean, first of all, to be clear, it wasn't the, the, the type of job that was so bad. It just wasn't, you know, where I was wasn't a good fit for me. I was doing uh, post-production sales, which I had done before at other places. And I, I, I enjoy post-production work. Like I mentioned, I still do some post-supervising freelance. But just this particular place and the particular, you know, mix of people and, and clients and everything. It just wasn't a good fit for me where I was and I, I wasn't very happy there. Uh, I had also gone through a divorce fairly recently at that point. Um, and uh, I had always wanted to write a book and I'd tried to many times. You know, I'd st I probably had four or five like unfinished novels laying around and uh I just decided, I don't know what it was, but one night I was like, well, you know, I, I'm not super happy where I am right now. I need to start working on some changes. And I, uh, one of the things I could do is I could write a book. You know, it's something I've always wanted to do. Like, why don't, why can't I just do it? And uh, I had taken a trip to uh, Japan, not super, it's probably made like five years or so before that point, but I really enjoyed it. And uh, I really wanted to go back, but it, it just for timing and money and work and everything. I just couldn't do it. And I thought, well, I could write a book set in Japan and that would sort of be a mental vacation. You know, I could kind of go there mentally. Uh, and so I was like, well, what kind of book would I, could I write there? And spy thriller just seemed to kind of go with that location really well, you know, like Tokyo and, you know, think neon lights and secret agents and spy stuff. And uh, so I just sat up this one night and uh, honestly, Almost everything from that book came from this one night of brainstorming where I just, it, it was like a flash of inspiration. I mean, even even the title, you know, I mean, it all, I, I was just like, okay, it'll be about this guy. What's his name? Thomas Kane. And, you know, what's it called? Tokyo Black. Well, what is Tokyo Black? And so all that brainstorming, really almost all of it made it into the book in the end. And that was where that started. Um, however, I didn't finish it around that time. I'd say I got about halfway. Um, and kind of lost steam, you know. It was, I'd never finished a novel and I, I it's, you know, it's a tough undertaking until you've done it um, a few times. <laughs> but a few years later, I was working at a place that I really enjoyed working at, things were great. Uh, and I had a, uh, a new girlfriend and she was over at my apartment and I don't remember if she wanted to read something I wrote or if it was just sitting around, but somehow she started reading the first half of this manuscript that was like on my desk. And she got really into it. And, you know, of course, she's not an unbiased opinion. So at first I didn't take it too seriously, but she would keep asking me questions about it. Like, well, you know, what's going to happen to this character? Or like, is, is this guy really the bad guy? And like, she seemed really invested in it. And that sort of got me to see it, you know, in a new light. Because I think when you're writing, I mean, when you're writing anything, but especially a novel, which is the sprawling thing that's going to take a long time to finish, it's really hard to assess your work, you know, like, is it good? Is it bad? And, it's, and even more so in a rough draft, you know, so I had really didn't know in my head, like, what this was or what it could be, you know, but seeing someone else read it and get invested in it kind of lit the fire again. And so that job was a freelance job. I knew it was coming to an end. And I also knew I had another job with those same people uh, in about two or three months, you know, like they were booked back to back. So I knew I had this gap and I said, well, you know, I, I know I have this two or three month gap and I know where my money is coming from, you know, for the rest of the year. So why don't I see if I can finish this book? 
And I'd say that was the point where I really got serious about writing, where I like made it a scheduled thing and I would sit down at 9 a.m. and work until lunch and you know, I would keep a word count. And uh, I didn't finish it, but I came pretty, I'd say I knocked off another quarter and that experience of working in that way was uh, very transformative for me. I was like, oh, I can do this. You know, I can actually fit, I can figure out now how to fit this in. And even if I have a job, if I set aside this time here, I can write this many words. And uh, so when that second job finished, I went back to the writing, I finished up the book and uh, you know, it, that, that was the start of it all. How many pages had you written when you kind of shelved it for a little while? Um, it was about half the manuscript. So I would say, uh, you know, in, in, in novels versus screenplays, you really think more in word count than in pages because the page is totally dependent on, you know, formatting and font size and all that. So I, I must have been, the book was about 85,000 words. So I must have been around the 30 to 40,000, you know, word mark at that point. So it was enough that you could kind of start to get a sense of the story, you know, and, and kind of get the flow of it and where it was going because that, you know, that's what led her to, I think, start asking all those questions. You know, an unfinished story is, I think, if you're on the right track anyway, it's like a, you know, it's like a, a it's like a itch, you know, you, you just have to know, like, well, where's this going or what's going to happen to this person, you know? And when you sat down that one night where you kind of had this dark night of the soul that I've got to do something <laughs> and poured it out, was this just an outline on your computer or like a It wasn't even sheet? an outline oh, okay. yet. Mm -hmm. I would say it was uh, just notes, you know, just no random notes. Um, you know, I knew I wanted it to be set in Japan and I wanted it to be a spy thriller. Um, I, you know, there's, in the spy thriller, a lot of spy thriller authors in that community are ex-military or ex-spies. you know, spies, And I knew I didn't have that background. So I said, okay, well, I'll make him a guy who was betrayed and he's on the outside. And then I don't need to know as much about the inner workings you know, of these agencies. Um, little things like that, you know, and I knew, uh, I knew uh, some of the locations and some of the characters, but I, I wouldn't call it an outline. It was more like about a couple pages of just random notes. And then I started making an outline, you know, from that point on. So you wanted to make him sort of this fringe outcast character. I did for, for multiple reasons. Be, a, for the reason I said, because I thought I, I thought I could do a better job with that. And also, I, I'm just always drawn to sort of outsider characters, you know. I mean, in Star Wars, my favorite character is Han Solo, not Luke Skywalker, you know. Um, but also, I think, I, I, you know, I did put a lot of thought into it. I'm a big uh, James Bond fan. And when I, I don't just mean the movies, I mean the, the original books by Ian Fleming. I, I've read them all many times. And so I tried to think sort of of what Fleming did, you know, because those books were written after World War II when Britain's influence was kind of fading. I don't know, this may be really boring, but, yeah, I, like but uh, you know, I think he created a hero that fit what England wanted at the time. You know, they wanted to feel important in the grand scheme of things, even though their kind of old world was gone at that point, you know, and their influence was diminishing. So he created this epitome of an English hero, British hero. You know, he's sort of middle class, he has money, but he's not a snob, you know, he's right in that spot. Um, you know, he, he's very patriotic to queen and country, but he's also very well-traveled at a time when many people weren't well-traveled. You know, most people did not get to leave the country back then. So, uh, so I kind of looked at what he did and I thought to myself, well, what, what does that look like for America now, you know, in this time period? And to me, I think Americans are, you know, we're marked by rebelliousness and we are more outsiders and our, our patriot, or at least my patriotism is more sort of, you know, a little bit cynical. We've gone through some things, you know, that, that, that makes it hard to just sort of take all that stuff on face value. So I just tried to go through that same process of what would, not just taking like that kind of character and making him American, but going through that thought process of what would an American hero in that mold be, you know, and that was how I came up with a lot of it. How was writing your escape at that time? I mean, that was the intent. I don't know if it really was, but certainly it allowed me to kind of mentally project myself back, you know, I mean, by the time I was finished writing the book, like I had, I had said to my editor that uh, I felt like I'd gone on a very, uh, very, uh, long vacation with some very strange friends because, <laughs> you know, I mean, it was it was all set in Japan. I, I did a lot of research in addition to, you know, because I'd only been in Japan for a very short amount of time, about 10 days. It made a big impression on me, but it wasn't enough. You know, I had to do research and, and also things had changed in the time. 
And I was able to kind of work that into the story because the character in the story has been in Japan in the past. And that's why they want him for this mission. He has experience there, he has connections. So he's sort of going back and seeing how things have changed as well. You know, so I kind of took that experience and put it into the book. Um, and, you know, I mean, it, uh, other, I'd say the escape was that A, it gave me something to kind of look forward to and to occupy myself with and to, you know, kind of put, because I really wasn't invested in the, the work I was doing at that point. This was something I was invested in. And uh, it just let me, you know, I, I, I always say I wanted the book to be like a sort of mental vacation for people. There were two kind of two goals I had for it. One was that it would feel like you had just seen like an amazing action movie. And the other was that you would feel like you had taken a trip to Japan. And sure enough, like if you read the reviews, like a lot of people say like, oh, I feel like I've been to Japan. Or I feel like I got to take a vacation reading the book. And that was really made me feel good because that was definitely one of the goals, you know, of the story, you know, of the, of the way that I wrote it, you know, the types of details I put in, the types of uh, little experiences I tried to sort of share, you know, underneath the big kind of action spy story. And you said you took like a two-month lull between jobs. You knew that the company was going to rehire you, so mm -hmm. you had this schedule planned out, mm -hmm. uh, which was this like a nine, did you say nine to five? Or yeah, not. I mean, it wasn't nine to five, but uh, I would I would get up. Uh, I would. I I don't remember the exact schedule, but I think I was writing by nine. I think that was sort of my goal. Um, I, I think I would get up, go to the gym, start writing, write till about lunch. Um, and I would try to get 2,000 words. That was my goal, you know, and, and still to this day when I write, that's usually what I try to do is about 2,000 words a day. And that would usually take me till around lunchtime, maybe maybe a little bit more, you know, but that's about how long that takes. So. And when the job resumed uh, or, or you picked up with this new project, then how did your schedule change and how did that feel? Uh, well, that was interesting because that job was a writing job. That was actually one of one of my first professional writing jobs when that job picked up. So it, w it was, uh, in some ways it was frustrating because I knew I had this book, you know, like just waiting that was like almost done, you know, and I'm like, if I could just get back to it. Uh, but on the other hand, it was also really fun because I was writing and I was working with people that are, uh, I had already known from before that I really liked and some of them were first time writers as well. So we had this great energy and it was a really awesome, fun time. I mean, so it certainly wasn't bad, you know, but yeah, there were definitely days when I was like, ah, oh, I wish I could just finish the book now, you know, so, so it was sort of when that job ended, it was kind of bittersweet because it was a really great, fun job, but I also was excited to get back, you know, and finish the book and, and get that taken care of. You talked previously about lack of confidence. How much would you mentally beat yourself up over things? Well, honestly, when writing that first book, I don't think I beat myself up about it too much because I didn't really have a plan of what I was going to do with it. You know, I just wanted to do it. Um, so in that sense, I think it was easier because I just, it was more about getting it done. To, you know, it's writing a novel at that time to me seemed like such an insurmountable challenge. I mean, it really seemed like climbing a mountain or something crazy. You know, I was like, so even if I could just do it, I would have been happy. You know, like that was all, that was all I was really sort of thinking about at that time. Um, I'd say the confidence more comes from uh, like in screenplays and TV writing, things where you really need to put yourself out there. You know, I mean, I worked that, that writing job that I talked about that I got really came about because finally after many years and many opportunities where I could have put myself out there, I just started, yeah, I don't, maybe it was just the right environment. It was a very creative kind of young company and everyone was super friendly and chill. Maybe I hadn't had the right environment yet, but I just started to say like, hey, you know, the development executive would, uh, I remember one time he was uh, like kind of pulling out his hair and I was like, oh, what's wrong? And he's like, oh, I forgot, you know, we have to shoot this sizzle tomorrow and I need a, a script and I, I didn't I didn't write it and now I'm screwed. And I was like, oh, I'll write it for you. And he's like, Are you, can you do that? And I was like, well, sure. You know, and I, and I was like, I figured, how bad could it be? You know, like they needed something and they didn't have it. So I figured anything's better than that. You know, so I, uh, I wrote it up and he took it home. And then he called me actually from the road and said, hey, I faxed it. I sent your script uh, to the boss and you know, he loved it. And he said, who wrote it? And I said, Andrew did. And he was like really surprised, you know? So from that point on, I started writing all of their, you know, their sizzle reels on all their pitches. And uh, I 
they actually optioned several shows from me. You know, they didn't get made, but they they you know it, that was sort of where I started realizing that you know it doesn't. There's no harm in putting yourself out there. You know, I just you know once I got a little positive feedback, it was easier. You know, but I should have been doing that years ago. You know, I mean, always if you have ideas, share them. You know, put them out there. Even even if people say no. It can't hurt. You know, you're going to hear a lot of no's in this business. You might as well get used to it, but you never know. So do you think it's having confidence or the rejections don't sting as much? And so then you're like, oh, well, oh, well, I'll just keep going. Probably a little of both. I mean, certainly I think as you get older, it just starts to get easier because you just inevitably accumulate more rejections. You know, I mean, it's like dating, you know, like when you're in high school, it's the end of the world if the girl you like won't go to the dance with you. But when you're 40, like, it's just another, you know, <laughs> okay, on to the next one, you know. Um, so I, abs- I don't know what, I don't know what the, I don't know what the answer is, but I think it's really important not to let rejection discourage you. I mean, I, I just think that's what it all comes down to. You're going to face rejection finding your own way to to face that and overcome it and just keep going and keep trying things i think is really what's going to separate you know the the winners from the losers can we go back to when you first came to la and talk about confidence when you maybe got off the plane or i don't know if you drove out here well i think when i when i came out to la uh, i was super confident because we had this movie and like we thought it was going to be great and we thought we were going to be you know like the next I don't know, like Clerks or whatever was the big indie thing at that time. I, and it didn't go that route, but even even so, like we were already on to the sort of the next thing, you know? So I, I, I don't, I think really what it was, was I think you, it's super important in anything, whether it's writing, novels, screenplays, relationships, anything, I, I, th- I always call it, or I say you need to be careful you don't give into lottery thinking, you know? It's like that idea that this one thing is it, you know, and if this one thing doesn't work out, you're screwed, that's it, you know, it's over. Or if it does work out, that it's going to make you, suddenly you're rich and on easy street. In my experience, uh, that's just not, you know, the way it works. I mean, sure, maybe it works like that for a very small percentage of people, like that's why I call it lottery thinking, but those are the people you tend to hear about. But even if you look at really successful people that you know, write a screenplay that that uh, you know does really well and launches their career, or that sell their first novel. Even even me, and I'm not saying I'm super successful at all, but like even my first novel, it's not really you know I'd written four or five half novels and dozens of short stories. You know, you don't see all the work that's kind of hiding in the shadows. You know, you just see that one thing, and so you think if I can just get this one thing, I'll have it made. And so I think that one, I, I kind of gave into that with that one script, you know, that I thought would get made. You know, there's no reason why I couldn't have kept shopping that script around or why wasn't I working on another script, you know, to follow that up. I mean, that went on for, you know, probably that whole option period was probably about two years. Um, you know, I certainly could have written other things, but I just got very tunnel vision focused, you know, on that one thing happening. And when it didn't happen, that just kind of, like I said, took the wind out of my sails, and I just kind of gave up for a while after that. And that was, in my opinion, a big mistake, you know, on my part. But you didn't go quote unquote back home. You stayed no, out here. because at that point I was pretty established here in terms of working. I had, you know, I had a job and I had a girlfriend and a life, and so I didn't go back home. And I still, I don't think I consciously gave up. Like I still thought in my head, oh, I'll work on this. And I still had ideas and stuff. But I can, I, in terms of the amount of work I put into it and the amount of effort I put into it, I can see I really kind of just let it slide from that point. I sort of stopped putting myself out there, you know, and, and that was a mistake. Do you think that the fact that you finished um, the first novel, that that gave you confidence? That certainly gave me confidence. I think, a lo- I mean, it was a lot of things. I mean, I finished the first novel. Um, and then I, I, a friend of mine, she was a uh, English major. She was my, one of my very good friend's wife. She had been an English major. She had done some freelance editing and she knew I was working on it. And she said, uh, as a birthday gift, I'll do, I'll edit it for free for you as an edit. So I had, I had done one edit, like where I just sent it off to a service, but I knew it still needed a little more work. So I was like, okay, great. Like it'll have like two edits and that'll get it into shape. And she read it. Uh, and she, you know, she also had a very favorable reaction. She was like, this is really good. Like, you know, I, I got to the end and I was just like turning pages to see what happened. And so, you know, she's still a friend, still not a completely unbiased opinion. But, 
you know, it was like a little bit more unbiased than my girlfriend, you know. So each step of the way, I'm like, okay, people seem to like this, you know. Maybe maybe it's not bad, you know. Um, and then really, you know, I ended up self-publishing it uh, through Amazon. Um, and I did that because I already had some projects optioned at that point, the, the TV shows I had mentioned. And I had kind of gone through that process a few times you know, where you're really, you're, you're sort of dependent on someone else, you know, in essence, unfortunately. And I just didn't want to do it again. You know, I mean, I, I knew I would have to for other feature, you know, screenplays and things like that. So I said, maybe I'll just do this for me and I'll just put it out. And I was fine, you know, if, if no one buys it or if it doesn't do well, that's fine. It's out there. I wrote it. I put it out there. That was really all I wanted from it, you know. Um, and I put it out and it did well, like not amazing. I, I certainly couldn't quit working off of it at the time, but it did well. And more importantly, the reviews were really good. And they were even more importantly than being really good. Like I said, they were exactly what I had hoped. You know, I mean, I, I put it out there saying I want this to be like a mental vacation for someone. I want people to feel like they've gone to Japan. I want them to like kind of get an experience outside their normal life. And I want them to feel like they saw like this really awesome action movie. And that's what the reviews were like. I mean, the pretty much all of my reviews for all of my books, the, the two things that come up more than anything else are, you know, I, I really feel like I was there and it feels very cinematic. Um, and I'm sure that comes from the fact that I had much more experience at that point with screenplays than I did with novels. And I guess that translated. But so when I started getting those reviews, I'd say that probably was the biggest confidence builder because these are people who not only don't know me they spent money and bought it and they liked it so I I think once I saw that I was like okay like I, I have something here and I need to start you know pursuing this did you promote the book at all once you had it on Amazon I did um, you know there's a whole sort of once I decided I was going to self-publish it I did do quite a bit of research into how that works and there's a lot of information out there there are a lot of other self-published authors and so I didn't just go into it blind. Um, and I actually do consulting with other authors to sort of help them because you really do need a plan. You know, I mean, there are, I think when I launched it, there were probably like 5 million books in the Amazon store. Now I think there's 10 million, you know. So if you just, you know, squirt it out there and don't do anything, it's you're probably not, you know, going to get, you know, if, if, you're, if your goal is just to publish a book and say it's out there, that's fine. I mean, I think that's a worthy goal for many people. But if you want to uh, make money off of it, you absolutely have to have sort of a marketing plan. So um, what I did was while that uh, editor, while that second editor was working on it, I wrote a novella that was a prequel. And so I started giving away the novella for free to uh, build up a list of reader, an email list of readers. And then when the other book was ready, then I could email all those readers and say, okay, now the sequel is, is available. You know, and that was sort of how I started it. So sorry, so Tokyo Black was the novel, but then you were preparing it, and then you wrote the novella and gave it away for free? Yeah. Oh, interesting, okay. So well, the, because it went through those two rounds of editing, the, the novel, uh, and the second round, the, the, the very kind woman who did it for free for me, you know, it took her a while, like, you know, because she was working a job at the same time. So while she was doing that, I'd say that probably took two or three months, like, for her to finish. Um, so while she did that, I, I wrote the, the novella, which I, you know, directly designed as a sort of prequel that would lead into it, so. How many words is a novella? Uh, that one was about 20,000. And then the novel was 85? That was about 85,000. Yeah. Interesting, okay. And so you gave that away for free and then, so you had your website, because you have a beautiful website, by the way, because you have these cool maps. Oh, where, thank that you. you have, or one map that I looked at where it, it has like the different books and then yeah. it shows which country it corresponds to. And, you know, it's beautiful. A friend done. of mine made, he's also an author. Uh, his name is Aiden. He made that map. He lives in uh, Australia. And uh, cool. I've worked with him on a few projects, and he put that together. I could never do that. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. But he made it for me. But yeah, um, yeah, exactly. So I would give it away through my website. I also, you know, when you're an independent publisher, you're or when you're an independent author, you are really a publisher as well. And so I had to learn quite a bit about um, advertising, marketing, um, and I started to dip my toe in all of that. And I ran uh, Facebook ads. Um, you know, I did... Uh, swaps with other authors in the genre where they would they would give away my book to their readers and I would give away their book and we would share you know uh, interested readers email addresses and things like that there's there's a 
you know, if, if you, once you start researching, none of these things are super uh, like groundbreaking or hard to find. Like if you're, once you decide you want to go down that path, there's a lot of resources out there. Um, there's groups on Facebook, there's books about how to do it. And, you know, these are all sort of the standard tactics you'll hear people talk about. How did you know who your audience was when you first started? <laughs> I don't think I did. I mean, I mean, other than that, I mean, look, I think, uh, you know, definitely they, there's a big thing in, in writing books about finding your ideal reader. And I think that's true to some degree, but I also think people go a little overboard with it because, I mean, I'm not, if I'm writing spy fiction, that's a pretty well tread genre. You know, I mean, if you like spy fiction, you know you like spy fiction, you know, or if you like science fiction, you know you like science fiction. So I never really worried too much about trying to pinpoint, uh, you know, is my ideal reader a 40 year old, you know, middle manager with, you know, two dogs and whatever. Uh, some people do, and if that works for them, great. But I just, I just thought of it, I just tried to write a book I would like. Honestly, that was really what it came down to. We'll pick back up on the business of writing in just a little bit, but we had a comment we received today on our YouTube channel, and it is, the more movies are structured, the more movies will feel unoriginal. Templates are fine if you don't mind to be unoriginal. If you're an aspiring script writer and you want to stand out from the crowd, you better come up with something fresh, something that doesn't follow, quote, the rules, and still work as a compelling story. Remember, most stories follow conventions. Real life doesn't. So if you want to create a compelling story that is fresh and true to life, stay away from the conventions. Any thoughts? Well, um, I think when you talk about uh, conventions, I think there's two, uh, two ways you can look at it. You can look at it as the, the, the writer's conventions in terms of the story structure, the beats, the system, if any, that you choose to follow. But I also think there are the audience's conventions. And um, in, especially in independent publishing, uh, you, you, if you don't give the audience what they want, they are not going to read your books. You know? And, I, mean, and I, I think some people might, you know, they call it in the, in, in the novel world, they call it writing to market. You know, if, if you know, this particular niche wants these things. And some genres are much stricter than others. If you're writing romance, for example, uh, there are very strict rules about, you know, there are happy ever after endings and there are, you know, sad endings and you have to tell the reader which one it is because if they don't like sad endings, they are not going to like your book. And, you know, there are alpha male romances and nerdy guy romances and harem romances where there's like one woman and or one guy and multiple women and then reverse harem romances where there's one woman and multiple guys. And they, they're very... Uh, particular about what they want. And so I think that, you know, at the, in, for what I write in terms of spy thrillers, I don't think it's as regimented as that. But certainly if I am selling my book as a action-packed spy thriller and, you know, there's the action doesn't stand out or the action isn't exemplary or if I make a lot of factual errors and present things that are just, you know, physically impossible, uh, if I get the weapons wrong, you know, the, the audience is very into the weapons. You know, if I, if I say, I remember, uh, I can't, I, I, in, my, in Tokyo Black, actually, in the first draft, I called the magazine, which is what holds the bullets, a clip. And I got so many comments about how that's the incorrect terminology. So I actually went back and republished. You can, one of the good things about self-publishing is you can always upload a new version of the manuscript. So I went in and changed all those and put it back up. Oh, um, wow. You know, those things are important to the readers, and I don't think it's fair to say that they shouldn't be, or to say that, or rather, I guess it's fair to say if you're going to ignore those things, then do so at, you know, know what you're doing. Go into it with your eyes open and, and have a reason for it, not just to break the convention. You know, I mean, if, if there's a point to it, it might work, you know, but if you're just, if you're just breaking what the audience wants because you want to do something else, you know, the audience, you're, I write for my audience. They're the ones buying my books, you know. Um, now, in terms of the structure on the writer's side, I do agree, I agree and I disagree. I mean, I think, I <laughs> this, is, this sounds very pretentious, but I think of structure as, I think of a story as analog and structure as digital in the sense that, uh, you know, digital video or digital audio is sampling reality and to making it sound real to your ear with with 
less information. You know, there's actually, so like a, a, the difference between a VHS and a DVD is there's, you know, on a VHS, there's an infinite variation of color between, you know, on the spectrum between blue and green, you know, whereas on a DVD at some point, it's digital, it clips off and blue stops and green starts. And it's just too small a gap for the human eye to see. You can't perceive it. And what I, I guess what I mean by that is I think that there's always a sort of inherent structure to a story, uh, but whether it follows these exact beats that people have come up with over the years, you know, whether you use uh, Save the Cat or The Hero's Journey, I think those are sort of just overlays that we put on top of it to make sense of it all. And I think that you just need to find what works for you as a writer, and that's, that's all the structure you need, in my opinion. So when you've gone back in to edit things, is it just little details that I realize they weren't little to the reader, but you weren't actually going back in? No, yeah. Reading. Or, you know, sometimes they'll catch a typo. You know, I mean, I, I do edit my books, but even, even in uh, New York Times bestsellers, if you really look, you'll find typos occasionally. So sometimes readers spot a typo, and I'll go in and correct that. But I'd never, I've never drastically altered the story or anything like that. And so I'm sure as your books have progressed, because you have how many out now? Sorry. Uh, well, I have two series. I also have a science fiction series. But in the, the Kane series, I believe there's eight, nine, eight or nine. And so the feedback that you've received, whether it's on Amazon or the people have emailed you, that helps shape the next sort of adventure that Kane To is some on? degree. I mean, yes or no. Um, I don't think, I, I've never really gotten an email like, uh, you know, you really need the books to feel more like this, <laughs> or, you know, or if I have, I haven't necessarily gone in that route. But uh, uh, I do communicate with my readers, and some of them some, some of them are experts, you know, in weaponry. So there's, I have a lot of readers in the military, you know, so I'll reach out to them with questions like, hey, you know, uh, the latest book, which hasn't come out yet, is set in Vietnam. You know, what are... What weapons would the Vietnamese army use, you know, a standard issue that he could maybe get a hold of, you know, things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll ask for feedback or for information on those kinds of areas, like help with research. Um, the third book was all set in uh, Sudan and South Sudan. And so I asked some readers who had traveled through Africa for some information there, you know, like uh, just things about the area that I couldn't find through research, um, you know, little things like that. And this is all set in current times? Yes. Okay. For the most part. I mean, it's kind of a vague timeline, but they're not, you know, they're not like World War II stories or anything. It's meant to be contemporary. And the internet, so the... It's the internet in, exists, Okay. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Does story structure make a movie better or worse? I think it makes a movie better. I mean, I think that... But again, I think that that structure does not necessarily have to be you know, at the inciting incident happens here, and then you've got three beats of fun and games, and then you've got this, you know. But I think that a story needs to be working towards something, you know. I mean, I, th I do think that we tend to see things in beginnings, middles, and ends, you know. Um, and I think as a writer, you should sort of have a sense of where you're going and where you are in the story and the, the escalation of things and the drama and the conflict. Um, and obviously, I think certain genres, it's more important than others. You know, I think if you're doing an action movie, it's very important that, you know, you want your biggest bangs to be last. You know, you need to be building up to a big finish. So I think structure is super important there. If you're doing a, you know, a, more, a small kind of family drama, maybe it's a little less important. But I think that one way or another, I do think that structure is ultimately a good thing. I just think you need to find the structure that resonates most with you. And that's what will work best for you. Do you think structure is fairly similar uh, for novel writing as it is for screenplays? Yes and no. It, it was it was a really hard thing to wrap my head around when I started writing novels because my only experience with structure was screenplay structures. And you know that question you asked me earlier about pages. You know, I would I would always think in pages as well. You know, from a screenplay, and it was really hard to figure out like, well, how does this novel? You know, I could look in a novel, but there's no like metric to compare it, this book to this script. You know, like how do I figure out like where in the script, where this point in the script would be for this book? You know, it's very difficult. And I mean, I got really obsessive about it. I mean, I even sort of figured out like, okay, well, my average screenplay is 105 words. So that translates to, you know, uh, 
there's this many words on a page of, of, of my screenplay. So at you know, 10,000 words in the novel, I'm at about page 30 in my screenplay. You know, I really kind of broke it down. I don't think that's necessary, but I needed to do that so that I could understand it, so that I could kind of wrap my head around it. Uh, now I think, I think I've sort of internalized it to a little bit. So I think there's still a beginning, middle, and end. And I think that some writers that's all they need and their their structure isn't super rigid. Uh, like if you read a Stephen King book, he doesn't, or he says he doesn't outline. And I I can feel his, his books are very loose. You know, I'm not saying that's obviously Stephen King. I mean, that it works for him, you know. Um, but I think the reason why, like I mentioned, many, many, many reviews I see over and over on my books, they say it feels cinematic or it feels like an action movie. And I believe that that's because I internalized that screenplay structure and applied it to the book. And I think that's why it feels that way. So I think it all depends on what you're going for. And sometimes people say that as a negative too. They'll say, oh, you know, it didn't really feel like a book. It felt more like a movie. And they mean that as, as a negative. But I still, that still doesn't bother me because I'm like, okay, clearly they didn't like it. It's not for them. But what I'm trying to do is still being conveyed, you know. What is a loose outline versus maybe a more structured outline? Well, for me, when I do an outline, I, uh, it gets much easier after you've written a few books because I think you sort of find an internal rhythm. So for me, my books tend to fall around 70 to 90,000 words. That's kind of the average range. And I tend to have about, uh, you know, 30 to 40 chapters. Like, and my chapters tend to be 1,500 to 2,000 words each, you know. So having gone through it and now knowing that, I can sort of lay out, you know, what it's going to be. So, you know, I tend to, I tend to almost like note carding for a screenplay, I usually take an Excel document and I just put 40, you know, rows and I just sort of write each chapter what I think will happen, you know, just a couple sentences. I don't go too crazy. Um, but I do know other people that create, you know, 30, 40 page outlines where they're really going into the nitty gritty and the detail of it. So again, it just depends what works for you. So basically when you start a new novel, you will go to that Excel document and you'll do 40 rows and just loosely put out maybe not even what the title's called, but sure. just... Yeah, the title's usually... I mean, I usually start with the title, but sometimes I change it, you know, I mean, uh, sometimes it's just a working, sometimes I know it's just a working title, other times, you know, that just, I come up with a better idea, you know. Sure, so then just one or two sentences about what's going to happen. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's not always complete. I mean, I find if I know the ending, it's usually for the best, but sometimes I don't. And sometimes I just reach a point where I'm like, you know what, I'll just have to figure it out when I get there, you know, and, and I'll start. But usually I try to know you know, what the ending is going to be. So have you ever gotten stuck where you really couldn't sort of write your way out of it? No, but I, sometimes it's more work than it would have been. You know, there's a, so I have a science fiction series uh, called Talon and the fourth book in that, I, no, I did have an outline. It was a loose outline, but I, I, there were a couple things I think I should have nailed down a little bit. So I got about three quarters and I was like, mm, you know what, I need to go back and change some stuff. So I kind of put that aside and worked on something else for a little while and then I'll come back to it and uh, kind of not start over, but just, you know, backtrack a little bit, change some things, let the effects ripple out, and then, you know, go forward and finish it. But in Kane, it's usually been pretty straightforward. I think I tend to have a clear idea of, uh, of what the ending's going to be because it's, you know, with science fiction, it's sort of tough because anything can happen. You know, it's very a very big genre, whereas with spy thrillers, you know, it's a little more contained and the outcomes need to be a little more imaginable, you know, like sort of by definition. Was it your intention to make it a series? Oh, yeah. Oh, from the very beginning. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I didn't know if I could really follow through with it, but I mean, I always loved those kinds of series characters. I mean, I, I was a huge comic book fan growing up. I like that kind of storytelling. So certainly in my head, I always thought, you know, as I was writing it, I had ideas for what the next book would be. And, I, you know, I try to kind of just keep those compartmentalized because it's like, well, we'll see. <laughs> Let's see if you get through this one, you know. But uh, yeah, I intended it to be a series. Do you have writing rules that you live by? Hmm. What do you mean? Can you elaborate more? You know, I mean, some people say, you know, never be boring. I don't know. These are these cliche, you know, writing is rewriting. There, there's oh, so many different okay. ones, but ones that you just... Well, I... I I don't know if they're rules. I would say that I, they're, maybe they're more... Well, the, the rule, the only rule is once once I start 
a project, I write every day. I mean, it's a job to me, you know, so like, you know, in between books, I might not, but once I have started a book, it's like, okay, I'm now writing 2000 words a day on this book. Usually I take off weekends, you know, Monday through Friday. I just, I try to be professional about it. Um, so I'd say, I guess that's a rule, but in terms of, uh, guidelines I try to follow, um, I, uh, I, I read a lot of books, you know, before I started, one of the things that inspired me to start was I would read books. And I think if you read enough and write enough, you come to a point where you start to realize that you're reading something like, I could do better than this, or I could do it at this. You know, I could at least do something as good as this. Maybe I could do something better than this. And I noticed a lot of books, I felt like the um, locations didn't really come alive for me. You know, I, I would read and they would just say, oh, we're in Syria. And it never really felt like it, or the author didn't really dive into it in more detail. And that was something I really, I wanted to do differently because again, going back to Ian Fleming, one of the things I appreciate about his books are he was a journalist and he had an eye for detail. And when you read one of his books, you really get the sense that he went to that place, you know, and you feel like you've gone there. And it's even stranger with him because he was writing in the 1950s. So you almost feel like you've gone back in time, you know, to this other place because that place he's writing about, you know, doesn't exist anymore. So... You know, I always try to make sure that I am uh, bringing the location to life, you know, for the reader, like uh, without going overboard. I don't want to like pound them over the head with details, but I just want them to feel like they were there. You know? I also, uh, I think from the cinematic side, a thing that I would notice is I would feel like the action in books sometimes would kind of fall flat for me. You know, like the example I always give is uh, you'd read a thriller and at the end, the, the guy's chasing the bad guy up to a roof and he gets the roof and he shoots him and the guy falls off the roof and that's the end, you know? And I was like, that's too easy, you know? Like, so, you know, to me, like, if that's gonna be your climax, like, the guy should run up to the roof and then the other guy jumps over to the next building and then the hero jumps, but he falls through the skylight. Now he's running underneath the bad guy, you know? I always try, so I call that, uh, I always try to escalate the action. You know, I, I, want, I want the action to like sort of build and build and so like, you know, a yes, but, or does the hero succeed? Yes, but, or does he fail? Yes, and, you know, like kind of keep it going to one or two levels, you know, beyond what would be obvious when you start the scene. So the, I don't think there are rules per se, but those are things I always try to do. Uh, that's important to me. That, that's kind of what I like to see in a book. So that's what I try to put into mine. Are your books heavy on dialogue or it's mostly a action? Mm, I, I don't know, honestly. I'd say a little both, I mean. I'd say it's pretty even. I mean, it's a it's a thriller, so I think you're going to have more action than in a drama. Um, but I certainly don't intentionally cut the dialogue. But I do try to write. I think my style is naturally a little more terse, you know, more more on the sort of Hemingway or Chandler side than the Fitzgerald side. You know, like I think that's just my natural rhythm. You know? And do you speak out the characters? Do, do you? Do no. You, oh, you don't. Okay. <laughs> I don't. I do know authors who do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I also know authors who dictate uh, instead of actually typing. They, you know, they speak. They speak it. I've tried to do that, but it's very alien to me. I just feel the connection of with my fingers to the keyboard just feels much more natural. Um, but no, I don't. Uh, I don't speak the dialogue. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine doing that. But I know it works but for some people. When I directed uh, the independent movie that I did, the the which I also wrote. Uh, one of the actresses said she it would drive her crazy. She said I, I would be mouthing the words next to the camera, which I wasn't consciously aware of doing. <laughs> I certainly wasn't trying to do that, but she's like, "Stop it!" You know, and I was like, "What?" She's like, you're, "I see your mouth moving." Like, so That's like, great. maybe, maybe, maybe as I'm writing, I am, and I just don't realize it. I don't know. That should have been in the player. <laughs> That's really funny. By the way, what was that film about? Just quickly, what oh, <laughs> it's a very, very strange. Uh, it is a it is a comedy about bad Catholic schoolgirls. Ah, okay. <laughs> I'm sure there's an audience. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not it's not what you would think. Oh, I, okay. I, I should have. I would probably made much more money if I'd made it exactly what you think it would be. But uh, it's much more of a it's kind of a cross between John Waters and John Hughes. You know? Okay. Did you go to Catholic school? I didn't, but my girlfriend in high school did. Ah, okay. So I sort of had an exterior view sure, of sure. the uh, insanity. I have a quote here from you. And it says, to keep things fun and interesting, I like to gamify the writing process. <laughs> I try to set up small goals and milestones for myself on the way to the finish line. Recently, I hit one of those milestones and crossed the 30,000 word mark of a new novel. 
time to celebrate. Can you tell us more about how you gamify your writing process? So what I would do back then, I think what, what that quote was referring to was uh, on my website, I would uh, release little tidbits of the novel. You know, So I would sort of, I didn't want to talk about it too much you know, ahead of time because number one, things can always change as you're writing. And number two, that kind of gave me something to look forward to. You know, So when I would get a few, you know, 10,000 words in, 20,000 words in, I would release uh, little like location reports, um, you know, just about areas where the book was set. And, you know, that's simultaneously fun for me. And it also helps build excitement about the book, you know, as people are starting to see like, ooh, like it's, he's in China and there's a bullet train and now he's visiting uh, this, you know, jungle in Vietnam and, you know, those kinds of things. So uh, that's what that quote was referring to. Re really, it was more about, um, communication with my readers, you know, and sort of, because they do, you know, your readers are a source of inspiration, not, not, not inspiration in the sense of, hey, do this, do that, but just knowing they're out there and knowing they're excited, you know, and waiting for this next book, that is a huge, uh, you know, lift for me anyway. So I would kind of parcel it out, you know, so that I could kind of sustain myself. Uh, you know, I, I don't, it's not, it's not as hard for me now that I've done it a, more times, but in the beginning, and I think that quote was around my second or third book, you know, and so that's really helped me keep the enthusiasm up and keep going. Yeah, I would imagine so, because I'm sure we all have days where we're like, oh, I don't know if anybody cares, yeah. and then when you find that someone does, it it does inspire you to want to do. Okay, cool. Well, they care, so then maybe I should. Absolutely, it, it makes yeah. all the difference. You know, it's it's huge knowing that someone is excited, you know, for what you're doing. And someone sent you like a silver wolf with, with piercing blue eyes? <laughs> yeah. It's beautiful. Oh, I wish uh, I could send you a picture of it. But yeah, so the one of the... It's on your website, I think. Oh, yeah, it yeah. is. It is. Yeah, it that's how I saw website. it. There's a, there's a book in the series called Cold Kill. Uh, it's, an, it's another novella. There's kind of... The Kane series is kind of split into novellas and full-length novels. And the full-length novels all, you know, move forward sequentially in time. But the novellas jump around. You know, they're set in different periods, like some are set before the novels, some are set, you know, when he was still with the CIA. And one of them involves him in Siberia, in the tundra, um, being hunted by these uh, Russian commandos. And one of them is called the Iron Wolf. And he has like this uh, wolf you know, necklace and he's a cannibal. Like, so like if he, he wants to basically catch Cain and eat his heart, you know, because he believes that that's how you absorb the, the power of your kill. You know? Oh, gosh. So uh, this guy in England really loved that book. And he, he, uh, he was inspired to create that wolf's head. And he was sending me pictures of it as he was doing it. I was, I was just floored. I was like, wow, like, that's amazing. I never thought he would send it to me. I mean, he's in England. You know? I just thought he was showing me like, what he was working on. And I thought that was great. Uh, and then when he finished, he said, you know, okay, so what's your address? And I was like, well, why? He's like, I'm going to mail it to you. I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm in the U.S. Like, you can't do that. Like, it's fine. He's like, no, I made it for you. And he was very insistent. So I, I gave him my address and he shipped it to me. And it's in my office. You said you have it like as a reminder? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's to my left. So, you know, if I look at that, I know, I know there's at least one person out there who is excited enough about my books to do that. You know, so that's a... It's, uh, it's pretty inspiring. It was stunning. The yeah, it's, it's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then the eyes light up. There's right. like a little diodes hidden in it. And, oh, I didn't yeah. know that part. Wow. That's really cool. How has your gamifying your writing process changed over time? Well, I think, I mean, I don't think it's as important to me because, like I said, now that I've done it more, I think it's, I think now for me, the game is more, you know, just finishing, just going along with the book and finding exciting new things that maybe I hadn't thought of originally. You know, I think where you divert from your outline is just as important as following it. I think it's good to have it, but you know, when better ideas come, you need to feel free to you know, go off and pursue them. Um, so I think for me now, it's more about just you know, trying new things. And you know, I've, I've tried, I've, I started a new uh, series, actually. I just finished the first book in a brand new series. Um, that was written in a different style, you know, like the Kane books and the Talon books, which are the sci-fi books, those are all written in a third person, you know, omniscient, but this new series is first person, uh, present tense, so it has a kind of film noir sort of quality to it, you know, but it's in space, it's a science fiction, but with a kind of Chandler-esque, you know, vibe. Um, so just trying, you know, just trying new things, just keeping it interesting for myself and 
you know, I, I don't think the gamifying is as big a deal anymore, but it, it's it's still always great to hear from readers and to know that they're out there and interested you know, in what I'm doing. And how long has writing been your full-time job? I would say writing novels specifically was probably only my full-time job for about two years because, you know, the, the indie author world, it's very dependent on output to the point where, you know, when I say I write 2,000 words a day, that actually would probably be considered fairly slow, you know, for most independent authors. Um, you know, there are people out there that write 5,000 words a day, 10,000 words a day. Um, and I just didn't want to go that, I just didn't enjoy doing that. You know, when I would work for that long or write that long, I wasn't, uh, I don't know, the, the, the pain, pleasure, balance, you know, just wasn't there for me. So I started, so I've sort of diversified my income streams a little bit. So I do receive income from my books, but I also do uh, freelance copywriting uh, on the side. Sometimes if a cool uh, post-soup gig comes up, I'll take that. I recently post-souped a uh, interactive movie that was really kind of interesting to me on a technical level. Um, and I also have some screenplays that have been optioned and that are being shopped around. So, I mean, I... I I sort of, I, for me, it worked best to kind of diversify, you know, what I was doing. Uh, I think I, I mentioned this before, but when you are a full-time author and that is your only income, it is a lot of pressure. And I found that although it was really cool and really exciting when things were going well, when things weren't going well, you know, or it was, it was e again, easy to get discouraged if you're not careful. And I just found that that pressure... I didn't enjoy writing under those conditions. I actually enjoy writing more now, you know, because it's not the only thing I'm depending on. Did you think that would be the case? I didn't. I was really excited to go full time with it. Um, and I was kind of surprised when I realized uh, that it, it, it wasn't the best fit for me. But by the same token, I don't think I would ever, I would not, I don't, I have a hard time imagining myself in sort of a typical, you know, nine to five corporate job. I don't think I could go back to that. Most of the things I do, I'm very lucky that they do still involve some element of creativity. Um, I've also done, like I said, I do consulting with other authors and I've done some creative consulting on screenplays. Um, so I, I still get to sort of exercise those muscles, um, but it just keeps it fresh and it keeps like too much pressure from going on the writing side. And when there is that pressure, do you find you're less creative or you're more just stressed out? And it's I, Yeah, I don't think I was less creative because the work I did during that time, I still am happy with, but it just wasn't as much fun. You know, it was, it was just harder on me to do it. And also it's, uh, it's harder, you start to develop, I, I'm, I'm sure you've heard this from other people, but it's very easy to develop like an imposter syndrome where, you know, and, and I find this even more so with novels where, you know, you're working on it for so long and you're all alone and nobody sees it. And you start to wonder like, well, Maybe I just got lucky, you know, the first time, you know, or maybe I just got lucky the first two times. Like my fiance jokes that like when I finish every book, I always say, this is my worst book ever. And she's like, you say that about all your books, you know, but you just start to like wonder. It's just hard to kind of keep things in perspective, I, I found for me. So I would just be much more hypercritical on myself in, in a non-constructive way. You know, when, when all I was doing was writing the books and that was it. I would be uh, super, super critical and hard on myself. That's interesting. So it sounds like you said there was sort of a confidence issue when you first got here and then you received so many no's or you just got to a point where it didn't bother you as much. And then it sounds like there's this other point where when you start, and that's, that's very interesting there, to me. There is, but I, I mean, I definitely think that now having gone through all that, I, mentally I know like you're just psyching yourself out. That's not true, you know, of course, You've written eight books, like you you have, you know, you're, all of them are rated very highly. So I can sort of talk myself off the ledge, but I definitely believe that um, once you do achieve, that's sort of what I was saying, like with the whole lottery thinking idea that, oh, if when I do this one thing, like I've got it made, it's not really, at least that's not the way it felt for me, you know, because even that one, even the after the second book, which was enormously successful and really allowed me to do whatever I wanted for a couple of years, you know, after that, but I still was worried, you know, when I would write, I don't know if this is any good, you know, and like, I mean, it's, I think it's just, it's just sort of in the back, this voice in the back of your head, you just need to learn to ignore it, do the work, and then 
assess, you know, if it's good or bad. Because until you're finished, it's not good or bad. You know, it's nothing until it's done. And even then, you can go back and edit it and improve it and work it. Nothing comes out like perfect. You know, it's it's you just have to do the work and trust in the work, and then go back and try to make it the best it can be. So it's not just if I get this many downloads or this many purchases, I'm home free. Then there's this new pressure. Not for me. I mean, I can only speak for myself, and you know, some people may be less critical of themselves. Some people, I think, have different goals out of publishing. I mean, I do think there are authors out there that um, probably just look at it as a business. You know, I mean, there are authors who put out, you know, like a book a week uh, or hire ghostwriters, you know, and I'm not criticizing their practices. Like, it's, it's almost like I said, when you're an author, you're also a publisher. When you're an independent author, you're a publisher. And I think some people sort of gravitate more to that publishing side where it's a business and a product and they have an assembly line that they, and they may or may not care very much about the individual products that come out. I don't know. But uh, for me, you know, I'm very invested in the books. I mean, like I said, I want people to feel like they're having this experience, like they're traveling to this location. And, you know, I, I've drawn on a lot of my own travels and I always feel this sort of pressure to capture the place, you know, in a fair and believable light, you know. Uh, and so for me, I just found that, um, there was a lot, a lot of imposter syndrome. Like after, even after the first two books, which were really successful, I would always be like, this isn't good enough, or I don't know if I can do it again, you know? Sure, I did it two times, three times, four times, but can I do it again, you know? It, that was always kind of hovering over me. Do people encourage you or discourage you from putting the novella out for free? Oh, um, you know, honestly, I don't think I really talked to anyone about it. Uh, <laughs> I. Um, I had, like I said, I had sort of done research on what other authors had done, and I had seen that that had worked for people, and so I just did it. But um, nobody, I don't, I really didn't tell people a lot about what my sort of long-term plan was at that point. I kind of kept my cards close to my chest. Um, in fact, I remember at the time, the that company that I had done some writing for, you know, when they found out I was publishing books, they were like, oh, they must be uh, horror books. You know, we'd love to see them. I was like, oh, no, actually, they're spy stuff, you know, because like, the writing I'd done from, for them was a horror-based thing, and they knew I was a big horror fan, so they were really surprised that I had written something totally, you know, different. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't didn't, don't think people really chimed in on that one way or the other. So once the, the actual novel came out, uh, you were able to leave your job? Yeah, I mean, it sort of worked out. Um, I didn't, I was a freelance post soup at that point. So really, I just stopped, you know, looking for gigs was what I did. Um, and I just focused on the next, uh, next books. And I did that for about two years where that was the only income I had coming in. But like I said, after two years, I did start to, the, I just felt happier when I had other things, you know. I still do a lot of writing and I still put out books regularly, but I didn't want to have to put out, you know, four or five, six books a year. Like, I wasn't happy trying to do that. Um, and I did try, you know, I, the science fiction series I wrote very quickly. I put out three books in one year and I like those books. But after that experience, I was like, no, I want to slow it down a little bit, you know, so... Have you ever done a book signing or gone to read? No, somewhere? because, I mean, I do sell hard copies, but mostly it's uh, ebook. You know, the, and when you're when you're an independent author, I'd say ebooks are going to be probably ninety percent of your sales. So Kindles and Kindle, like that. yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I I had some books that were wide, some books that were exclusive to Amazon. It just depends. But that was most of the money. Also, audiobooks are, are starting to become bigger. But still, I find most of my revenue comes from ebooks. So, did you read for the audiobook? No, <laughs> no, I didn't. I uh, I don't like my voice, like I said. So I uh, no. But also, I think. Uh, to me, that's a skill. You know, there are professional narrators, like that's what they do. Sure. Know? And so I wanted to work with someone like that, you know, that, that would really elevate it. Had you ever really thought of what the voice, the actual voice of the character was? I did. I mean, I, not in the sense of, I didn't put a lot of thought into it, but I certainly hear him in my head. I, I know what I think he sounds like, you know, so I would listen to narrators. The first audiobooks actually weren't independently produced. They were with a, a company licensed them from me. Um, so they had final say on who narrated it, but they did, they sent me candidates and I chimed in like, oh, I like this guy. I don't like this guy, you know. Interesting. And so it's an American accent or yeah, British? Yeah. Okay. He's American. Wow. And where did he grow up? Kane? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. Yeah, okay. So know. we know nothing. Yeah. He's sort of a cipher. Um, Interesting. very little of his past has been revealed. And in fact, there's sort of a running joke in the books that 
whenever someone is about to mention his military record, it says, you know that he's a veteran, but it never said like where he served or in what branch he served. And whenever someone's about to say it, like someone else always cuts them off or someone says, oh, that's classified. And so readers will always sort of offer their theories like, oh, he must have been a Navy SEAL or he must have been, you know, a Marine Force Recon, you know, but it's never been said like what he was. So, Does he give away any tells with food that he might like or a, a phrase? I tried to, it was the, the intention of the character was that he be somewhat of a, a blank slate. You know, I mean, he's very, I wanted there to be sort of an element of mystery, almost like he's almost like a force of nature when he gets involved, you know, in something. So, I mean, he's, he certainly has traits, you know, he's very, he's sort of cynical. He's someone who's been betrayed and he's someone who has an intense self-loathing because he, you know, he looks back on the things he did in, in the CIA and the Army with regret, you know, because he's seen now that it, not everything was what he believed, you know, that it was. So he is very distrustful of people that kind of elevate themselves morally above others. You know, he's very he's kind of bitter and cynical, although gradually through the books that sort of changes. You know, he starts to kind of go on this redemptive arc. Um, and he's, you know, he's, he's someone who's lived all around the world, so he's very uh, open in terms of, like, what he'll eat. You know, I mean, the books are set all different places, and I always try to, I kind of try to present him as someone that can sort of fit in almost anywhere. You know? um, he drinks whiskey for the most part, and he doesn't like very sweet things. Those are, those are about the only two things I can think of that are consistent. Is there a part of you that wishes the books would do better on Amazon so that you wouldn't have to work anymore? Well, I mean, like I said, the work that I do is is work I enjoy. So it's still creative kind of stuff. So, I mean, I don't, of course, I, I wish the books could be number one New York Times bestsellers. You know, I mean, why not? Like, of course, I would always want them, no matter how successful they are, I think I would want them to be more successful. Um, and they are nowhere near, you know, that level of success for sure. But uh, no, I don't think that I would want to only write books. I mean, I, I enjoy it. It's a big part of what I do, but I would also want, I mean, honestly, I think what I would really like would be the freedom to sort of slow things down, you know, write fewer books that I could also write some screenplays and maybe some TV pitches and, you know, maybe, uh, you know, do, do the author consulting, which I really like. I like helping first time authors and kind of showing them, you know, the ropes and what I did and kind of getting them started on the right path. Um, because there's a lot of uh, scams out there and like predatory businesses that kind of prey on first time authors and screenwriters. I mean, I'm sure you guys have seen that kind of stuff. So I, you know, I, when I do consult with authors, it's very inexpensive and I'm like, don't spend money on this. Like, don't give anyone $10,000 to publish your book. You know, don't do that. You know, it's kind of steering them away from the obvious scams. So I enjoy doing all that. So I don't want to necessarily give that stuff up, but sure, I mean, who doesn't want uh, more success, right? And when you work with these authors, they are ones that have, have a finished novel? Sometimes they do, sometimes they're in the middle, you know, sometimes they haven't finished yet. Sometimes they've written several books, but they just haven't been able to kind of achieve success and they're not sure like what they should be doing differently. It's kind of all over the map. How can one word in a story be so powerful, can make or break a sentence? Wow. Um, I don't know about one word, but I do think that um, word choice obviously can really color you know, how a scene flows. And this probably isn't what you're getting at, but uh, this, this is an example of something that really surprised me. You know, I, I always feel like most of my leaps in writing quality come from writing something else. You know? um, so for example, many, many long time ago, I was, uh, I, had a, a, I was writing a screenplay and I had a book that I was reading about writing novels because I was always trying to write a novel, you know, sort of in the background of everything. And I don't even think this was a particularly good book about writing novels, but it had one tip that I think is gold. Like this is a million dollar tip. So that for anyone who's watching this, I guarantee you this will improve your writing. And it, the tip was, when you're finished with a manuscript, do a word search for L-Y. Because most adverbs end in L-Y. And adverbs are usually imprecise and are not the best word for what you're trying to convey. And I was like, wow, like that really stood out to me. And so I took my script that I was working on. I said, I'll try it on my script. And I tried it on my script. And sure enough, when I'd finished, I was like, this is better. <laughs> you know, like it really made it better. So, I mean, I think... 
I think a lot of times when you're writing, you know, your first draft, you're kind of just trying to get it down. But if you can go back and see, well, what was I really trying to say there? You know, and if you're using words like he walked slowly to the door, like, well, is that really what you mean? Or do you mean he stalked towards the door or he crept towards the door, you know, or he sneaked towards the door? And, you know, if, if you know, I don't think always that applies, but a lot of times I think you'll find that you were really trying to say something else a little more specific and by getting rid of that adverb and finding the, the right word, it's going to make the scene pop you know, in the reader's head. It makes it much more visual because you can envision someone sneaking. But if you envision someone walking slowly, you might not see the same thing. You know? and, and I think that really helped my writing. That was just one of those little like aha moments that I always remember, even though it was you know, like probably 20 years ago. What's the male version of the Mary Sue? Oh, there's a name for that. Um, That's what I thought. I can't remember what they call it, but there is a male name for it. Yeah, the character who's just perfect, like who never fails and never... I think really what... I don't even think it's the fact that they're perfect. I think it's that they never have to struggle. I think that's what people don't like. You know, we don't want... And that's, I think, why it goes back to what I said before about escalating action. You know, we don't want our heroes to resolve things easily. You know, we want them to struggle. We want them to fight. You know, we want we want us we want them to show the strength that we wish we had, or that we believe that we have. You know that, and and when things just come easy, what, that's not an interesting story. You know, right. So with your novels, it seems like from the get go, you're establishing that this character is <laughs> not a Mary Sue. In no, way. yeah, Kane. I mean. I guess it depends on, of course he's the hero, so of course he tends to win, but I always put him through the ringer, you know, like, I mean, he gets hurt, he gets beat up, he gets, you know, cut and shot, and, you know, by the end, he, he you know, could a person who went through all that really win at the end? Maybe not. That's where I think fiction comes in and we're, we're, we'll suspend our disbelief. Um, you know, when I was growing up, uh, the two, two of the big uh, action heroes in the box office were... Uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme and Steven Seagal. And I always liked Jean-Claude Van Damme better because Steven Seagal never took a hit in his movies. He just went through and wiped the floor with everybody. No one touched him. But Van Damme would always get beat up, you know, or he's like crucified on a pole or, you know, something. And at the end, he rises up and he wins. Like, that, to me, that's the story I want to see. That's great. I like that. That's pretty funny. <laughs> that's true. You're right. <laughs> And just pushes him out of the way, and he never gets dirty. Yeah, he never gets he never gets touched. Like his hair is always perfect. Yeah, exactly. Because that is the marsh. He does Aikido, which is oh, all okay. about redirecting attacks. But I, for me, as a hero, I never, I just couldn't. I didn't like him. You know, it just bothered me. What's your work schedule like when you're writing? Well, like I said, I, I'm usually. I used to write, start writing a little earlier. I think, I think I used to start writing around eight or eight thirty. Now I usually start by nine thirty. Is what I try to do, but I still try to keep it like kind of half business hours, you know what I mean? So basically I try to start when I would start a normal job and I write till about lunch, you know, somewhere around there. Uh, and then after lunch, I may still write, but it'll be other things, you know? So, so the book I'm working on will be the first thing that I tackle and I'll write that till about lunch. And then after lunch, if I have other things I'm working on, like a screenplay or a copy or even stuff from my own business, like advertising or email newsletters, things like that. That's when I'll, I'll work on the other stuff in the afternoon. And you take weekends off. Yes. <laughs> Is that something you've ever been tempted to say, ah, why don't I do something? All the time, like but my fiance gets very unhappy when I, <laughs> when I do that. Uh, sometimes, like if I'm almost about to finish, I'll be like, look, baby, I just gotta finish this book. And she understands. But, um, you know, for the most part, I, I try to, devote the weekends to other things. And I think it's good to let your brain recharge, you know, before you dive back in. Have you noticed that then when you're at the point where you have to finish and it's seven days a week that you feel like some of your creativity is dwindling? Not really, because usually when I get to the end, you, know, you, get, you get this big kind of burst of excitement, momentum. You're like, oh my God, I'm done. You know, it's almost done. Like I can just see the ending, one more chapter. Uh, so usually that's when I'll, we'll work on weekends and that kind of carries me through. Certainly, I think if I tried to do that all throughout the book, absolutely, I would get burned out. I think it's good to have breaks and to let your brain kind of think ahead, you know. Um, but when I do do it, it's usually very kind of exciting, you know. It's like the, the final stretch, you know. Have you always loved every character you've created? Well, I mean, I, I don't love... Hmm, that's a tricky one. <laughs> 
I don't like you have to create characters that you you have to understand your characters. I don't think you have to love them in the sense that some of the characters you write will not be deserving of love. I mean, uh, you know, I've written some horrific uh, villains, but I always try to give the villain a reason, you know, for what they're doing. Um, most of my villains tend to have sort of tragic backstories because I think that. I just think in the real world, that's the way. That's the way I see the world. I see suffering leads to more suffering. You know, everyone kind of has their own worldview and their own take on villains. And I don't think there's anything wrong with a villain just being sort of bad, inherently bad. But I do think that I just find it more interesting if there's a little bit of a reason why you know they see the world the way they do. Um, so I don't know that those characters. I love them, but I understand them. How do you stay invested in a story if your character's unlikable, or there's parts of them that's unlikable? Well, I think if parts of them are unlikable, that's fine. I mean, there's parts of parts of everyone is unlikable, right? Nobody's perfect, and you know, at, at a, a story is about a person struggling to overcome something, right? So their flaws can be just as important to that process as their strengths. In fact, probably more so because. If they're put into something that's playing perfectly to their strengths, then it's probably too easy for them. It's their flaws that make it interesting. So I think the more you incorporate those flaws and their weaknesses, or you know, a big a big uh, kind of ongoing thing in the Kane stories is one of his problems is he can't trust anybody. You know, and so sometimes that actually causes him to make the wrong decision because he's so bitter and so cynical. If he just Trusted his agency contact, things would go better, but he can't because of what's happened to him in the past. You know that makes it more interesting and more dramatic, um, and I think that makes it also easier to stay invested. I, I think it would be harder to stay invested in a story where the hero is just sort of infallible and you're always playing to their strengths and they win every fight and overcome every. That I would have a really hard time staying interested in in writing, you know, as well as reading. Can you give me some examples of how he shows some of his weaknesses? I know you said sometimes he doesn't trust his agency contact. Well, for instance, so in the latest book, he um, he's kind of come in from the cold, and now he is working with the CIA again um, because there's you know there's someone that he actually does trust is now in a position of power, and they've you know he's gone through this whole process in the other books, and now he's he's working for the CIA again. So they send him uh, into to Vietnam to find uh, this missing contact, and they have a someone to. They say, you know, we'll we've got a contact to, for you to to meet with to get some intel from, and they'll set you up with everything they need. But he refuses to deal with that person because he's like, no, I trust you, but I don't trust everyone else working, you know, for the CIA. He's like, I'll go through my own contacts, and so he goes to sort of this shady character that he knows, but that character. Ends up betraying him because they're a scumbag, you know. Like, and so he kind of realizes if I had just listened and you know trusted this person, like it, it would have gone way better. Now he's jeopardized the mission because he couldn't put his trust in his superiors, and so he has to kind of he's kind of working under the weight of that knowledge that wow, I almost screwed this all up, you know. So that's sort of that's the most recent example I can think of. And why doesn't he trust actual people within the agency, but he trusts some fringe character? Because he really shouldn't. I mean, it's a mistake. But he, because he has a history of being betrayed by people within the CIA, and because he doesn't, he sees the work he did with the CIA in the past as not really being noble. You know, he realizes he was kind of used, and the things that he did weren't really making the world a better place. You know, in his opinion, so he just has this kind of wall of anger and guilt, and really kind of self-loathing in essence. You know, I mean, it's. I think. I think it's more about him being angry at himself for being fooled, you know. And that that lead, when you're angry at yourself, you don't make the best decisions, you know. And I think that's a case where I intentionally had him make a bad decision, you know. I mean, he he later regrets it and realizes that wasn't the smart thing to do. How many Thomas Kane books have you written? Three novels and four novellas. Uh, two of those novellas I co-wrote actually with another author. Uh, and there's a fourth book uh, that has not been published yet. Um, that's with an agent who, uh, you, I think you asked about this before, but he's considering. You know, he's shopping it around. We're considering maybe signing with a publisher and seeing, you know, what that might mean and what what might be out there in that avenue. So what is that? Four, four. It's so about eight, eight Thomas Kane books. 
And why haven't you tired of this character yet? <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I you know, I think I think part of it, I think, is because I did keep his past mysterious. So there's always something else to reveal. You know, I, like I think if I had one of the things I wanted to avoid was that I saw in a lot of thrillers what I call like the resume. You know, where they'd be like, oh, we're gonna bring in this guy. He's ex special forces and he served five years in Libya. And you know, they kind of go down as the whole thing. And to me, that kind of takes the mysticism out. It takes something away from it because. I sort of feel like, well, if the only thing that's special about him is that he's a Navy SEAL who did these things, then any Navy SEAL who did those things is the same. You know, it's sort of so I, I wanted to kind of avoid filling in like every little detail. And, and, and by doing that, I think it allows me to kind of find new angles and new things that, you know, I find interesting about him because there is a, a big black space, you know, in the background. So his his background is, is a mystery. All we know is that he was betrayed. Uh, at, at a certain point in his life, but is he a mystery to himself, or, or you don't go that far into his mm, thought? Well, I, you know, I try to go a little bit into his thoughts, but not too much because I feel like, in fact, I originally when I first conceived the series, one thing I did change was I originally was going to write it first person, where you would hear his thoughts, and I realized I was like, well, if I do that, then I feel like I'm giving too much away because you're always going to know. You know what he's thinking. So a lot of times, so I switched it to third person. And a lot of times, when someone asks him a direct, you know, really probing question, I'll have him just like look at the person and not answer. And I try to let the reader kind of project what they think the answer might be, you know, onto it. Um, I, so I, I really do make a concerted effort to, as much without, you know, without sacrificing character and making him someone believable and someone you can invest yourself in, I make a concerted effort to keep as much of him in the dark as possible, you know, so that, because I think that that allows the reader to inject a little of themselves and their opinions and their beliefs, you know, into his character. Well, why is he doing this? You know, I, sort of like as an example, in that first, the first book, Tokyo Black, he's, uh, he is sort of driven to help this girl. And he's, it's never really explained why, you know, he sees a picture of her and he just, kind of from the very beginning is inclined to help this girl. And I remember the editor kept saying, you know, I don't understand, like, why does he want to help this girl so much? Why does he want to help this girl so much? And to me, maybe this was wrong, but I just felt like if I went and spelled it out, that would sort of cheapen it. You know, I was like, I don't know, he just feels this compulsion, you know. But by leaving it open, that's what I made the novella about. So in the novella that, you know, that I gave away for free, it's sort of outlined this experience. And I don't directly connect the dots, but you could read the novella and say, oh, well, maybe that's why he might be inclined to help this person. Because here in this story, he didn't help a person in a similar predicament, and this is what happened. You know, so you could make that connection or not. You know? So that's sort of the way I try to handle that. When you write a spy thriller, does the protagonist really change? It's tricky, you know, I, I don't think the protagonist has to change per se, but I do think some, I think there's two ways you can go and I've done both. I think they can change like in one area or in some area or the world around them can change. Um, I think, you know, like a character like James Bond, for example, changes very little throughout the books, but the world around him changes, you know, he stops things from happening or he, I mean, really, most heroic fiction is about reasserting the status quo, right? Like something has gone awry and it's up to the air to set things right. Um, and I think that's perfectly fine. I mean, there's a million books and movies that, you know, does Indiana Jones really change, you know, between those movies? I, I don't think he does, but they're perfectly entertaining. So I don't think it's a requirement. But I do think when you're writing, it's certainly more interesting on the writer's side. And I think this might kind of go down to like what you're saying about the reader's expectation and the writer's expectation. I don't think the reader expects your hero to change necessarily book to book. But as a writer, I think it's more fun if you can sort of inject a little bit of change. And so that's why over the course of the first three books, like I mentioned in the fourth book, he's back to working with the CIA. And the, the course of those first three books is sort of about that change, about him slowly kind of coming in from the cold and learning how to trust again and, you know, kind of rebuilding his life in essence. And to coming in from the cold, so from being sort of this outlier, this like fringe character and now being in this structured environment where he's totally watched. Yeah. Probably has. has that and also I think 
sort of believing in himself, you know, believing that he can actually make a difference and do something good, you know, because he starts off very bitter and angry at himself, like I said, for the things he's done in the past. And there's a part of him that honestly believes, like, if I get involved with these people, I'm just going to make it worse for them, you know, like just nothing good comes from me, you know what I mean? And so I think he's gradually kind of lifting himself out of that. I mean, he sort of starts out, you know, a little bit of kind of self-pity, you know, I mean, he's he's living off the grid, he's kind of operating as a petty criminal and just kind of surviving. And so there's sort of this theme in the first book about, you know, surviving versus living, you know, he's not really living, he's just surviving. Um, so little things like that, but I but they're not drastic changes. I mean, he's certainly consistent you know throughout the four books and I that to me that's enough to keep it interesting for me and I don't think the readers really want him to you know suddenly you know wake up and be a totally different person or have a huge you know come to Jesus kind of thing I don't think that's what readers of that genre are looking for okay true or false Mm -hmm. question here all major characters have strong motives and that their own journeys aren't always in alignment with any other character all right, let's do let's break that up into two. So all major characters have strong motives. I mean, I don't I don't I'd feel uncomfortable saying all anything. I mean, like I said, I don't think there's rules and I'm sure there's great stories that might not pop into my head where they don't have strong motives. Uh, maybe like uh, Dazed and Confused, that's a great movie. I don't know, I'd have to see it again, but I don't know if I'd say they have really strong motives. I think it's on that movie's almost about them sort of finding a motive, like by the time they get to the end, you know. Um, but I think that certainly most characters tend to, and, and I think it's probably easier to construct a compelling story around someone that has a really strong motive versus someone who doesn't. Like, for example, uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, you know, I mean, that guy is obsessed. Like, his entire life revolves around figuring out, like, what happened and getting to this point, you know, and he can't even explain why, but he's willing to give up, you know, his family and his job and everything. Like, that, that, I think it's, I think it's easier to construct that kind of story than someone who's just kind of ambling along. And then the second part is um, that their own journeys aren't always in alignment with any other character. Sure, I'd say that's true. I mean, because that's flexible, right? It says aren't always. So maybe they are, but they certainly don't have to be. How do you keep track of your characters and all of their motives? You know, <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't really have a hard time with it. I know some people make, uh, you know, charts like Excel sheets. Um, like if you read a lot of books on outlining, say to, uh, you know, for each scene, you always want to write down like the main character and what their goals are for the scene. I find for whatever reason, that just isn't an issue for me. Like I tend to know what the character's motives are. I just, it's, maybe that's, I don't know, maybe that's just how I kind of come up with the scenes from in the first place, but I've never really had a problem with that. Like it's just sort of in my head. How important is that first opening page? I think it's certainly important. I think people, I don't know. I mean, I guess it depends on your style. I mean, I think some people really want that amazing sentence that just hooks you. I, I'll be honest, I don't tend to write that way. I don't tend to have that. Usually, I think my openings are more kind of uh, setting a place and kind of drawing you in, you know. Um, I think one way or the other, you need to interest a reader, but I think there's lots of different ways of doing that. So I think, again, you just have to find what works for you. You know, but I think if you read my books, I don't think you would like read the first sentence of any of them and be like, that's an amazing first sentence. You know, I, I think uh, that just isn't, the, isn't my style. Okay, so it's not, it was the best of times. It was the worst of time. It was nothing <laughs> no, like that. Maybe, you said but I, I know, uh, uh, who is it? Uh, Lee Child says that he like spends days, like he'll rework the first sentence over and over and over, you know, to, to get it to be just right. I, I don't know. I, for me, it's more about the mood I'm establishing in that first page than like, you know, getting that sense that really pops. But, you know, everyone's different and, and you have to find what stylistic touches work for you. How do you keep an underlying sense of danger and tension in every scene? I think um, a lot of that is part of the setting. You know, understanding understanding the location lets you kind of describe it in a mysterious, dangerous way. You know, I think if you if you have a feeling for the location, 
where, you know, is it a seedy area? Is it a high crime area? Is it a rich, wealthy area? You know, like what, what kind of things are either likely to happen to you there or what might be surprising to happen to you there, depending on the direction you want the scene to go. But I think for me, uh, a lot of that comes down to knowing the location and really getting a feel for it. I know that might sound weird because it's not directly related, but that's usually what I go to first, you know, is like, what is the mood of this area? And then how can I sort of color that mood to be a little bit more dangerous? So let's say someone, how would, you said that this character, Thomas Kane, is a chameleon in some sense. He can really blend in. So how is he operating when walking through a bad part of town, whereas he's walking through a business center where there's professionals with nice leather shoes? Um, most of the stories actually tend to take place in more kind of seedier locations. So I think he's probably more at home in more dangerous areas. I mean, he, there have been, usually if he's in an area that's more upscale, he just kind of acts like a tourist. You know, he acts like kind of a clueless tourist because he knows that's the most likely scenario for why someone like him might be there. Um, but I don't know, in terms of making the audience feel like something can happen, I feel like you sort of need to have a sense of the locale. You know, I, there's a, you know, the book three that's set in Sudan, um, you know, that's a war-torn region. And so I, you know, I really tried to kind of play up the, you know, the condition of the buildings and there's armed soldiers walking around everywhere and, you know, everyone's kind of on edge and you see like smoke rising from a building somewhere because it was bombed, you know, the previous day. Like, you know, those kinds of details I think are what make the reader start to think like, oh wow, anything could happen here. Like, you know, who knows? Like, uh, so I think I, to me, it kind of comes down to the location and, and communicating that to the reader. It's interesting that you said that he would pretend he was a tourist. And I had heard that from a journalist on a panel. She said that when she would go into certain war-torn countries, she would very much put on like a, a touristy garb and because she was less of a threat. Right. And and, and so people overlooked her. You yeah. Know, which is very interesting. Yeah. I mean, if you're, you know, if you're a, a, a white guy walking around China, you know, like, well, there are really only a few <laughs> things that are plausible and why you would be there, so... I see. So, so he kind of has a camera and and I don't. He looks doesn't go that like, far oh, with I it, see. but he just sort of that just tends to be kind of the rationale, or he just you know kind of pretends he might you know he might pretend he doesn't understand the language even if he does, or he might uh, ask for you know in one uh, scene uh, he asks someone for directions right before he attacks them, you know, because he's just trying to play off that he's like a lost tourist, you know, things like that. We imagine there's many, many times you've put Thomas Kane in some impossible position where it seemed like he wasn't going to get out. Is there an example that you can use where you backed yourself into a corner and how did you get out of it? So you're writing and you're like, wait a minute, how am I getting out of this scene? I don't have a plan for it. Sure. Um, actually, in the very first book, uh, the, the climax takes place on a, a thing called Tokyo Sky Tree. Actually, when I started writing it, it took place on something called Tokyo Tower, but in the years that it took to finish the book, uh, Tokyo Tower became no longer the tallest structure in Japan. You know, that when I started it was, when I finished, it was this thing called Tokyo Sky Tree. So I moved it because I thought it would be more exciting to be the tallest, you know, building in Japan. So Tokyo Sky Tree is this big, big tower. I think it's about half a mile tall, with like a little observation uh, deck at the top and uh, I knew I wanted to have a scene with Kane, you know, fighting people at the top of uh, this tower. And uh, there's like a drone zooming around them and all this stuff going on. You know, for the outline, that's about as much detail as I would do. But when I started writing it, I was like, well, okay, uh, at some point he's going to be hanging off the tower. And then what? You know, like, what do I do? Like, obviously he can't fall, but how do I make it interesting that he doesn't fall? You know, like, what does he do? Does he just pull himself back up? Or like, what makes the bad guy... Uh, go away, you know, or like, and so I was sort of stuck, you know, I, I wasn't really sure what to do. But it, for me, the answer just came down to uh, research. You know, I just kept researching. It was really hard to find accurate uh, blueprints or pictures of the tower. I don't know why, but so I, I just had to keep at it. You know, most things when I research, I can usually find what I'm looking for pretty quickly. But for whatever reason, it just, I just had a hard time finding detailed enough pictures where I could sort of plot out the scene in my head. Finally, I found this video of people washing the windows at the top of the tower. And they have these little carts 
that like lower down <laughs> and then move along on tracks. And I was like, that's it, you know? And so in the scene, I had him spot one of these carts that's like hanging, you know, half up and he like is able to swing himself into the cart. Um, and then he has to like, you know, climb the wire and jump onto, there's this big like glass tube that wraps around the top of the tower where it's like an up where you can look, you know, 360 from this observation deck. So we had to like jump onto this tube and, you know, fight the guy on top of this glass tube, like way above the, the city. And so the, the research, just, you know, just not giving up on the research is really what allowed me to kind of finish that scene in a satisfying way. If you can't find what you're looking for with the research, at what point do you move on? Do you give yourself a time limit? Or is that part of the fun? I mean, I certainly wouldn't, I wouldn't stay on it for forever. I mean, I, I do think you have to keep things moving. And so if you're not finding what you need, I think you, at some point you either change the scene, like you go back or you just come up with something else. I mean, I think really it all comes down to what's satisfying for you, right? Because that scene I just described, I'm sure you could give that to 10 other writers and they'd come up with 10 other ways to make that interesting. You know, there's all kinds of things you could do, but it, nothing was clicking for me, you know? So I think at a certain point, if you don't find the answer, then yeah, you either need to just try a different tact or maybe go back, okay, well maybe he doesn't fall off. Maybe he throws the guy off and then realizes the guy has something he needs, you know, and he has to get him back or, you know, I don't know. You just try to find what would be interesting and, and work from there. I do think actually, um, I think a lot of people over research and you know I love research and it's important but I think that a lot of people use research as kind of an excuse to not get started you know uh, and I think that that's a danger actually I always try to I always feel like you should start writing when right when you feel you're not quite ready you know I think that's the time to start because I think if you keep researching and researching and researching you're just kind of you're holding off on the real work you know because that's not the real work and also I've found that I, I, I think you'd be surprised what you can get away with, you know, because if there's something you don't know, you just don't point the metaphoric or the literal camera at it, you know. I mean, and the novella took place in Thailand and I needed a, a scene by a river and I was kind of driving myself crazy trying to find like, well, where would a river be in this region? And, you know, I couldn't find anything. And finally, I just said, you know, why am I going through all this trouble? I just said, yeah, I just cut, you know, I just started the new chapter and he's by a river. I don't say exactly where it is. No one has ever like said, well, where could there be a river in this province of Thailand if he only had this many out? You know, I, I think that people overdo it on that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, I do, do what you need to kind of get yourself invested and interested. And I think you can do a lot as you go from that point on. You know, the internet's always there. Do you limit yourself though? Do you turn like the Wi-Fi off? It's not a, like no, it's not like a literal time. I just kind of have a sense now from having done it. Like, you know, you're, you're putting it off. Now you're putting it off. You know, it's like you're putting off the work. You're, you're researching too much. You got to just get going. You know, I just kind of have a sense in my head of when it's time to start writing. But do you turn off your email and different text messages? Not really. Uh, Sometimes, every now and then I will, but most of the time I, I'm able to just ignore it. You know, you know, I'll put my phone in the other room maybe. <laughs> What are the best ways to build plot twists? I think you just have to find what's organic to your story. You know, I, I do think you need to surprise the reader. I do try to, um, you know, sometimes when I think of a scene, I'll try to think, okay, this is the way the scene would go, but what if we went this way instead? You know, like I haven't seen that. But I also think you need to be really honest with yourself when you're doing that. Like, does this work better? Like, because just because you haven't seen it doesn't mean it works. You know, and I, I do, I would rather be effective than novel, in my opinion. I mean, sure, it's good. I, I do try to create new things. And I do try to go in unexpected directions. But if you're going in a direction that's not satisfying, I, I think you're sort of, uh, you're writing for yourself and not for your readers at that point. You know, I mean, I, as an example, I wrote a, a short story once about a, uh, a guy who uh, is a werewolf and every time the full moon comes out, he chains himself up in the basement and he like tranquilizes himself, you know, and so that he won't hurt anyone. And then, you know, then he has this whole process of how he gets out of it the next day. And then one day he does all this, but someone is still like mauled, you know, in the town he's in. And so it's sort of, he's sort of trying to figure out, well, how could this have happened? I know I was chained up. I know I did everything. And he's like trying to figure out what's going on. And when you get to the end of the story, you find out there's another werewolf, you know, that came to town. 
And to me, I thought that was really cool. But I remember one of my friends read it and was like, oh, you know, I was kind of disappointed because I really was, I wanted to see how he figured out how to get out. You know, like I thought that was going to be the whole thing that like maybe the wolf side of him is becoming smarter, or, you know, something like that along those lines. And I had never even thought about that, but I, it just made me think that, you know, for him, he found that story unsatisfying. And I think it's better to satisfy the reader when you can than just be different, you know, just for the sake of being different. You so said you'd rather be effective than be novel? Yeah, I mean, I'd rather the scene works and that the reader enjoys it and feels something from it than to be different just for the sake of being different. You know, I mean, you can, it's, and sometimes it can be easy to be different in a very cheap way, you know. I mean, if, you, if you're writing a, a spy thriller and you get to the end and the hero just fails, you know, like, sure, that's different, but it's probably not very satisfying to the reader unless you make that failure you know mean something or matter or lead to something else that's interesting but if it's just like oh you thought this would happen and instead this happens but there's it's disconnected from everything else or it's not satisfying to the reader i think that that's being novel but you're not being effective you're not you're not satisfying the reader you're not presenting a a, a compelling story and every chapter on a cliffhanger or a surprise ending mm, i I th if you can, without it being forced, I and mean, I always try to, you know, I think you, your goal with the end of the chapter is to make the reader read the next chapter, right? So uh, cliffhanger is a really good way to do that, but it's not the only way. I mean, I think even if you've sort of resolved the drama of that scene, you can sort of give a hint, you know, that, yeah, he got through this, but there's more coming or things aren't as safe as they seem. You know, you just, I think you always just try to leave with a little bit of, I don't know what to call it. Not really a cliffhanger per se, but just a, a sense of danger. Kind of like what you were saying before, like that kind of mood that, yeah, he survived this, but he's certainly not safe. You know, if there's, you're, the, the story's still moving. Would you put like a surprise revelation, just something that keeps people a little bit on their edge of their seat, but curious? I think actually one of my editors said what I tend to do, and they, they, they like this, like, oh, I like the way you end chapters, is I usually just try to find something sort of symbolic in the language that might be a little sinister. Like, you know, if, if they've just gotten through a big red car chase and it's sunset, you know, I might say, you know, the sun dripped red blood across the sky as they vanished into the horizon or something like that, you know, where it's, it's not really literally implying anything, but it just gives you this sort of mood of... Uh, danger, you know, and, and I remember an editor had said, oh, I really like the way you end your chapters with these kind of visual cues of, of something sinister, you know. And how do you start the chapter? Each chapter varies? Yeah, I mean, I just think, I think you, tr you want to try to get in late and get out right at the right time, you know. I mean, I, I try not to spend too much time with exposition. I mean, you need a little, but I try to do the bare minimum. Uh, and I just try to start, I mean, it sounds kind of silly to say, but I just try to start where it's most interesting. You know, I mean, if, if, if two people are in an argument, you know, I don't necessarily need to see what led up to that argument. I just want to start with the argument. You know, if they're arguing about whether they should, you know, send someone into this territory to get an agent out, you know, I don't need to see the girl walk up, you know, go in the elevator, walk into the office and sit down for the briefing and then get into the argument. I just want to start with the argument. You know, should we go in and help this guy or not? You know, that's the point of the scene. So I think that kind of comes down to knowing what the point of the chapter is. I mean, I do think that every chapter should have a reason for being there. And when I say chapter, it's kind of interchangeable to me with scene. I tend to write one scene per chapter, but not everybody does. So, you know, each scene needs to have a reason. If the reason is exposition, and sometimes that's necessary, I think you need to make it as short as possible, as quick as possible. Like, give them what they need to know and move on. Is that something you've perfected over the years? Because, you know, in the beginning, we just want to sit down and just pour all of this out. And <laughs> I don't know if I'd say I perfected it. I mean, I think I was always aware of it because, like I said, I'd written screenplays and things beforehand. And I do think screenplays kind of teach you to be very economical, you know, with your language because you're so constrained by time. Um, so I don't think I necessarily had a huge problem with it. But I do, th I will say that, you know, writing that first book I definitely would be more inclined to add things because I'm like, oh man, I don't know if I can make it to 80,000 words or 100,000 words, you know, whatever in my head it was going to be. So I'm like, all right, I'll talk about this, you know, and I would sort of go off on tangents. 
I, I, you know, I think through editing, most of the excess there was trimmed back. Um, but I don't, even then it wasn't, you know, massive. I mean, the, I think the difference between the finished edited book and the original manuscript was probably like maybe 10 or 12%, you know, so it wasn't a huge amount. But I do remember that sense of, I don't know if I can write this many words, like I better talk about this and talk about this, you know, and, and I, then and then when you do it, you realize, oh no, it's like, I actually don't have room for all that. I gotta get to the point, like, you know, cause and move on. How important is setting up clues? I think it, I mean, it certainly depends on what you're writing. If you're writing a mystery, it's super important. Um, my stories, I wouldn't say they're really mysteries per se. Um, they tend to be more about kind of this journey that King goes on in each one, you know? So it's, I don't think it's like, he's not necessarily trying to find out, you know, who killed, you know, suspect A or something like that. It's more about, you need to go find this guy and kill him, or you need to go find this guy and get this laptop that he has. And I tend to somehow connect the goal to something that happened in his past. So as he goes on this mission, he's sort of reflecting on, something in his past that troubles him or that you know that he failed or that uh, is a source of guilt for him so they're sort of if not directly linked then kind of metaphorically linked if you're writing a mystery you know obviously the clues are really important but i think in any case whether you're writing a mystery or even with me with where i've you know sometimes i have a scenario where there's a double agent you know and and you know someone is revealed to not be who you thought they were and usually that's planned out, but there have been instances where I've been writing a scene and I've thought, you know, this would just be so much better if this person was the traitor, you know? And the great thing about writing is you can always go back and add in, seed in those clues, you know? So if, that's why I said like before, it's good to divert from your outline sometimes and surprise yourself. There's nothing stopping you from going back where you introduce that character and maybe add in something that makes them seem a little shifty or add in a motive that, you know, you didn't have before. You know, I think people tend to think of writing uh, linearly, and for the most part you do, but you know, there's nothing stopping you from jumping around and changing things. How do you write action sequences, especially when you're using faraway exotic locations? Well, the first thing I, I try to do is, I, tr I think it's, uh, for a book, I think it's uh, really critical to engage all of the reader's senses. So I think an action scene, will play much better to a reader if they if you can work in things like sounds and smells, um, you know, how it feels when when you get hit or, you know, the, the sound a bullet makes as it just misses you and hits the wall you know, next to your head. I, you know, I, I try to make sure I'm, I'm bringing other senses into the picture, which is, you know, that's what a book can do that a screenplay, you know, can't do as well, per se. Um, and most of my readers tend to say that they feel like the fights, you know, feel very like, you know, immediate and cinematic and they feel like they're in it, you know, with the hero. And that's kind of what I try to go for. I want the reader to kind of feel like this is happening all around them. Um, beyond that, like I said, I do think it's really important to let the action build and uh, take the reader someplace where they're not expecting at the beginning of the scene. You know, I think if I think if you can predict the way uh, an action scene is going to end, to me, that's not a great action scene. Like I want it to be surprising. You know, so for instance, in my second book, there's a it's a very long action scene. I think it actually takes place over like three chapters. But there's a they're in a Chinese apartment building, and they're they're you know they're trying to find this laptop, and they get it, and they go back down to the the lobby, and Kane realizes he spots these people in the lobby that weren't there before, and he knows that they're he can just tell the way they're moving that they're agents that are after them. So there's a big fight in the lobby, and then they run up the stairs, and then they hear you know soldiers coming down uh, from the higher levels. So they were waiting stationed up there. So then they have to run down a hall. And then they jump out a window to the building next door, which is under construction. So then they're like in this fight in this construction zone. And then the cane, you know, falls off the construction zone into this giant uh, dump truck. So I did, I, you know, I had him falling into a truck and then I found out that China has these enormous dump trucks. I mean, they're massive. I've never seen a vehicle this big, you know, so I, I had him fall into one of those. And so it's like they're fighting in these like, you know, torn up little buildings that are sitting in this dump truck because they're just like digging up these hovels and making way for new high rises and stuff in Shanghai. So, uh, you know, so that's a scene that starts in a hotel lobby and ends with a fight on a giant dump truck, you know, in traffic. So I think uh, 
to me, that, that's, that's what I enjoy. You know, maybe not everyone likes that. I mean, some people might want a more sort of realistic or more, uh, you know, kind of gritty, you know, kind of type of thing. But I enjoy scenes that, you know, where you don't, you're not sure where it's going to go, you know, and at the end you're like, wow, like that started here and it ended there. That's amazing, you know. So that's just what gets me excited. Pacings, lulls, and suspense? Um, again, it's hard. I mean, certainly it's important, and it's something I try to pay attention to, but I don't know that it's hard for me to say, you know, do this or don't do that. I, I mean, I, I think uh, every writer kind of has their own pace, you know, and, and I can certainly enjoy uh, slower-paced work. I mean, I, I, I quite enjoy uh, slow-paced movies as long as they're interesting and you know, you're kind of seeing... I'm reading a, a book right now called uh, Ghost Month, which is a kind of mystery set in uh, Taiwan. And it's a very slow paced book, but very interesting. But for me, I mean, in the books that I write, I do tend to, I, you know, I, t I think I tend to start slow, build to a sort of a steady action kind of pace around the middle, and then really kind of pull out the stops at the end. That's just sort of the flow that I enjoy for those types of books. But I also think it's very uh, uh, personal because I have some readers, you'll read the reviews and be like, oh my God, it's like action packed and as a good thing. And then other readers will say, oh, I th thought the beginning was really slow, you know? And then someone else will say, oh man, it was just like nothing but mindless action as a negative. <laughs> so, you know, I think, it, I think it's very personal and I think everyone's different and you just have to find what feels right to you. And have you seen that in films too, especially nowadays where it's very fast cut action. It's almost like just it's this staccato type movement and it, it, it's too fast, you know, sure. it's too much. And I think it's interesting because I think that um, number one, you can be fast paced without doing that for sure. You know, if you look at uh, uh, a Jackie Chan movie, you know, they're very fast paced, they're full of action, but because he's doing all the stunts and things himself, he makes sure that there's lots of long takes so that you can see everything he's doing. You know, they, you don't cut away from Jackie, you know, because he's doing it all for real. But those are still fast paced movies. But I do feel that inevitably as you watch these uh, cuttier and cuttier movies, you sort of get used to it. Because I, I know the Bourne, Bjorn, the Bourne movies were particularly known for that. When I go back now and watch the first one, right. it does feel like, wow, the editing's so much slower. You know, it's like so much more leisurely paced. And then you watch the last one, it's like, bam, 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 bam. So you, you do sort of get desensitized to it as you go. But I, I don't know if books quite work the same way or not. So. Sure, sure. And The Raid did a great job oh, with their yeah. pacing, even though it was fast paced and, you know, different martial arts. But I thought the pacing was great. Again, yeah, I think they knew how to cover those fighters because they could really do that stuff they were doing. I think a lot of the, um, Amer not all, but a lot of the American movies are cut that way because the stars don't really know how to do that stuff. You know, I mean, they, they oh. get training and they do the best they can, but they're not able to make it convincing at full speed, you know, in a long take. Whereas someone like the people in The Raid or Jackie Chan, they can really do it and really make it look real. So why would you cut away from them, you know? Right. You said that Thomas Kane does not trust others. What are some of the things you do to create that distrust in the story? Like, are there traits that he starts to get worried with or are there his body language? Well, like, for instance, there's sort of an ongoing thing where, um, you know, the, his main contact at the CIA is a, a woman that he has a past with, he had a relationship with, and she thought he was dead and then found out that he was alive, you know, and he had, and he, he didn't contact her to protect her, you know, that kind of thing. But, uh, he never, um, he'll, you know, he'll never use, she, they always give him a phone, which he always disposes of and gets a burner phone. And he always like, will call her and they have this elaborate, you know, series of code phrases they go through. And then he's like, next time I call you, it'll be a different number. And he'll like throw away the phone. And she's always very frustrated that he can't just, you know, be a little bit more trusting, you know, things like that. Um, also, like I said, a lot, a, something I do a lot is when someone will say something, he won't comment, you know, even if, even if you would think the person might offer an opinion or, or explain what they're doing, someone might ask him a question or like, you know, what, what I can, what are you doing? Why are we doing this? He just won't answer them, you know, because he doesn't want to give them that information. Um, so things like that, I think are, you know, mostly what I rely on to kind of get that across. And for, for, in terms of showing an ancillary character, someone that may seem untrustworthy, are there little tells 
Are there things that you do to create doubt in not just Thomas Kane, but in wow. the reader yeah. as well? Yeah, I mean, I think it's sort of hard to pinpoint that, right? Like I, I think we all know when we meet someone, right, there's cues that you're sort of subconsciously aware of, like I don't trust this person or I do trust this person. Um, but to kind of, I don't, I don't, I can't really say like, there's no like set list of what I go to, but um, you know, certainly like in, in the second book, there's a NSA employee who is very, um, I kind of describe him as, you know, as opposed to all these other kind of serious, you know, politicians and intelligence people, like this guy acts like a used car salesman kind of, and he's very like chummy and overly friendly. <laughs> and so of course he's the sinister one, you know, I, I I don't know. I just sort of try to think of people that I meet my reactions to them and like what would set me wondering, you know, or what would what would I find off-putting. You know? Do you make your protagonist fully known in the story, but your ancillary characters a little more mysterious? So at least we know he's a mystery in the sense that we don't know too much about him except from a certain point on. And we know that he's been living as a petty criminal and he doesn't trust authority. So there's some things about him that are known, but then some of the characters around him, do we make them even more mysterious or no? We also know things about them. It depends. Well. Some of them are, some of them, yes, some of them, no. I mean, so most of the people at the CIA that you meet, um, you probably know a little bit more about them than Kane. Although if you really think about it, like I don't think I ever dive too far into people's backstories, mostly because it's really not relevant you know, to the story that's being told. Um, there is a character who is dead when the uh, when the book when the first book starts, but who is sort of an important figure in Kane's life. He's a former partner. Uh, a, uh, he was also like in the CIA's uh, Special Activities Division, but he came from the Army, so he gets brought up a lot. And like there'll be flashbacks to exp you know things they did together, missions they were on, and you learn a little bit more about that guy. You know each time, and so you can sort of look at him and say, okay, well, Kane's somewhat like him. You know, they're obviously they, they're friends, they have similarities. Um, but I think that I, I tend to not find backstory that interesting. All right, maybe that's just me. I mean, on the other hand, I think villains, I tend to go into a lot of their backstory because I'm interested, like, what made this person, you know, what they are. Like, like, you know, I, I'm not, it doesn't seem, it's not too big of a stretch to, you know, a woman working at the CIA and she's patriotic and, you know, she, you know why she's doing what she's doing. But, you know, in, in, uh, in you know, one of my villains is this uh, Chinese businessman named David Fang. And he is basically hates both China and the United States, like with a passion because of all the things that have happened to him. You know, his family was involved in Tiananmen Square. Mm. He has this Really, you know, he was he was he grew up in one of the cancer villages in China where there's like mm. severe pollution and both of his brothers are deformed. And so like all of those things have led him to this place where he has feels like no allegiance to his country and he also doesn't like the United States, so he's going to use this cyber weapon to you know wreak havoc and blame the US for it and and you know achieve this goal he has. Uh, so to me, that backstory, I'm like, yeah, I want to know about that. <laughs> you know, I want to know yeah. like, what makes a guy like that. So it just depends on their role in the story and, and what they're doing. Very interesting. So, so another conflicted character, very much like Kane. Oh, very. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's. Uh, I actually, I mean, I, I'm very sympathetic to him. I mean, I, you know, what he's doing is horrible. But I think when you read the book, you can totally see where he's coming from. I mean, this is a person who has been you know, screwed over by life, like at every turn, but who has risen above it all and become immensely powerful, you know, through his own will. So he sort of has this almost uh, hubris, you know, that he's been able to lift himself up above all these horrible things that have happened throughout the years. And so he kind of sees himself almost as a like a god, you know. But like I said, I do tend to have, I think, sympathetic villains because I do think ultimately you know, most of the suffering oh, in the world, right. I think, can be traced to other suffering, you know, the, the victims of suffering or of abuse or of war. You know, there's only, there's two ways you can go with that, and a lot of times you end up going down a darker path, so. Can you explain a red herring in the story? Sure, I mean, a red herring is like something you use to uh, divert attention or make you think, um, that something is important. Usually it's related to a twist. You'll have a red herring to make the audience look here and then the twist is somewhere else. So in the, you know, in the story I was talking about where 
there's this double agent and no one knows who the assassin is. You know, I certainly presented several characters that could have been, you know, the assassin where, you know, he has this one friend that's always tagging along and there's a Chinese, uh, you know, state security agent that's following them and, and, you know, it kind of seems to know a little bit more than you'd think he would know. And so, you know, you want to give the audience a couple different, you know, possibilities when you're, if you're going to pull off a twist or someone isn't going to be with their, or if there's a secret, you know, that's going to be revealed, you, a red herring can kind of be like, well, is it this or is it this or is it this? And that's good because then we like to try to figure that out. I think so. I mean, I think that. you like to try to, I, I don't think every twist needs one, but if you can do it and make it effective and make it not obvious, then I think it can be a, a cool technique you know, to use. You know, it's funny, like I, I feel, I find a lot of, uh, a lot of these sort of terms, you know, for me, I don't know, I, a lot of it's sort of instinctual. Like I have a hard time saying like, oh, I use this technique or I employed this red herring. You know, it's more like, I don't know, I just feel like I'm kind of drawing on all the stories and movies I've seen and okay, that's how they did it. How would I do it? You know, and, and it's kind of more, much more internalized for me. How do you fool the reader or do you not fool them and you <laughs> let them have the ultimate bird's eye view of the story? Um, hmm. I think that, uh, I, I've only tried to fool the reader a few times and I don't know, I think, well, first of all, I think you're never going to fool all the readers, you know, I mean, unless you just really pull something out of the blue. Um, and when I tried to do it, some people liked it, other people didn't, you know, I mean, so for, in the second book, there's a, uh, a character Cain is going to China to protect somebody and they know that there is an assassin after this person, but nobody knows anything about the assassin. They don't know what they look like. They don't know if they're male or female. They don't know. They just know that they go by this code name of Red Phoenix. That's the only thing they know. And so there's a character who's introduced and uh, hmm, it's tough to talk about because I don't want to give it away. Sure, sure. Basically the, the gender of a character, you know, I didn't want to say if the assassin was a male or a female. And so I used the, the, were they quite a bit, the, the genderless singular they, which, you know, technically is correct English, but it's unusual. You don't come across it very often. And so I did get a lot of readers commenting that, hey, you made a mistake. You kept using a plural and it's just one person in this fight. <laughs> I was like, no. I mean, I got a lot of emails about that. So I sort of regret, you know, doing that. But other people were like, wow, I was so surprised when it was revealed, you know, who the killer was. So I, I you know, I think you just got to, you do your best. You decide, if, I think it's important to decide like, why are you trying to fool the reader? Is it important to the story or are you just trying to manufacture some sort of surprise, you know? Because I, I mean, for the most part, I don't really think, I think it's better to deliver something in a satisfying way than to just be surprising, you know? So I would rather... In that case, it was important to the story, you know, like who the assassin was and why they were doing what they were doing and the surprise mattered. But in, I haven't tried to do it again. And for the most part, I don't, I think unless you've got a really good reason for doing it, like there's not a huge, uh, there's not as big a payoff as you might think. Is there a right way to open the story or a wrong way? I mean, I don't, I'd hesitate to say there's a wrong way or a right way, but I do think, I think in general, you know, your best bet is to always begin as far into the action as you can, you know, without making it confusing for the audience, you know. So, I mean, if if five or six things happen to get you to the point where the story begins, I don't, you don't always need to see all those things happen. You can just have a character say, like, these things happened and now we're in this situation and we have to send someone here, you know. I mean, I think you want to try to cut to the chase as quickly as you can, but but I don't think there's like an absolute rule on where that is, you know, or, I mean, I think you just need to go with your gut and, and go, also I think you need to go with like what is important to you telling the story. Um, in the third book, which is set in Sudan, I'd start with uh, this character walking uh, from a, you know, from one village to another because I really wanted to sort of get across the conditions, you know, that these people are living under. It's a, they're in a war-torn region. They can be literally killed at any second. I mean, they've had, you know, they're the, the newest nation on the planet and one of the poorest. And, you know, I, I kind of just wanted to show what that would really be like, you know, and this guy like walking past these obliterated buildings and, 
you know, delivering like, you know, little meager scraps of food that he was able to buy, like rotten fruit at a market and stuff like that, you know, to, to families and things like that. So it wasn't necessarily the most sort of exciting action packed opening, although it does go on to end with an attack on the village. So it does end with action, but it was maybe a slower build up. but I thought it was important to get across what life was like here because it kind of colors what happens in the story later. So to me, that made sense. You know, I, I think, uh, yeah, it's hard. I think you just have to kind of go, you just have to sort of trust in yourself and, and what is important to you and what's interesting to you and try to look at it from a reader and make sure that it's going to be interesting to them too and, and do your best. Have you visited all of the countries? No, <laughs> I've certainly okay. never been to Sudan okay. or Siberia. Um, but, you know, I've done a fair bit of traveling in Asia. And so certainly for the first... Uh, two books I was able to mostly you know pull from my own experiences. How do we risk insulting the reader? Well I guess I mean every reader is different right so those things you just mentioned I don't think I would find insulting I think I kind of find the opposite insulting if you like have to explain like every little thing to the point that it's kind of pedantic also, I think things that aren't satisfying are sort of insulting in the sense of like, if it's a Mary Sue character and I never feel they're in any jeopardy, you know, why am I wasting my time with this? Or a twist that feels unearned or that when I think about it, I'm like, that doesn't really make any sense. You know, that's sort of insulting. But every reader is different. And I mean, I've had some readers comment favorably and negatively on things that I wouldn't even have occurred to me, you know, just very sort of extraneous strange things. I think if you just do your best to tell a good story, I don't think you're in danger of insulting the readers that you're not going to insult anyway. Because I think inevitably, when you put out a creative work, some people are not going to like it and some people are going to love it. And that's just the way it is. So I wouldn't worry too much about insulting the reader. As long as you're being true to the story and doing your best, I think that's all you can do. But if there was a risk of insulting, it would be over explaining. For me, mm -hmm. but I don't think everyone's like, you know, everyone's different. I mean, so you may, you may get someone else who says, I didn't understand what was going on. Like, you know, I, I think it's, an ev I just don't think you can, there's no blanket level that's gonna work for everybody, you know? So you just have to do what feels right to you. Uh, I don't personally enjoy uh, Tom Clancy books because they're so detailed with the, you know, the technical information. I, you know, I, I read Hunt for Red October and I mean, it's like a manual on how a, a submarine works. His readers clearly love that. You know, that's what draws them to it. And that's great. It just isn't what I like, you know? So, whereas some people love the action scenes in my books and call them cinematic, other people find them unrealistic or, you know, or, or unbelievable. So I, I think, I just wouldn't worry about it too much. I mean, I, I really don't think you can you just don't know how people are going to react to your stuff. I think the most important thing is tell a good story. Would you recommend aspiring screenwriters begin writing novels? Yes and no. I mean, certainly I think there's benefits from exploring different kinds of writing. Um, most of my, I would say, sort of uh, leaps in terms of craft for any writing usually came from exploring other kinds of writing and applying things I learned. So. I mean, I think I gave the example earlier about, you know, searching my screenplays for LY to eliminate adverbs, you know, that came from a book about writing novels. But I also think applying that kind of screenplay structure to my novels is what gives them that cinematic quality that some of the readers seem to key to. Um, so I think it's certainly worth trying. You know, I mean, if you, I think if you enjoy it, go for it. If you don't enjoy it, I don't think you should, you know, punish yourself and like force yourself to write a novel if you're like, I really just want to write screenplays if you don't enjoy the process. But I do think if you do enjoy it, uh, it's certainly good to kind of expand your creative muscles in other areas. I think only good things will come from that. Did you do a lot of short stories? In I the did. Um, I mean, when I first wanted to be, when I first took up an interest in writing, I mean, I was very young, I was a kid. And uh, I really loved comic books and I wanted to be a comic book artist, you know, or create comic books. I don't think in my head I had it split into writer and artist. I just wanted to make comic books, but I wasn't a very good artist. So I started writing instead. You know, that was what kind of led me to writing. And I really, at that point in time, I kind of only thought of writing as writing books. You know, we're talking like six or eight years old, you know, very young. And so I would start writing books. And of course, an eight-year-old is not going to finish a book. You know, <laughs> I would start writing something and I would lose interest in it immediately. And, you know, that would be that. And then I discovered um, 
Robert E. Howard, who wrote the Conan stories. And uh, the in, at, that really kind of opened my eyes that, oh, like, you know, these are separate short stories, but they all feature the same character and are all set in the same world. So it kind of builds this bigger thing, you know, and, and I can wrap my head around finishing a short story. So I started writing short stories then, very, very much Conan ripoff stories, you know, same kind of thing. It was about a, uh, a Viking fisherman with a trident, you know, who like went around fighting monsters and stuff. And, but those were the first stories that I sort of completed, you know, from start to finish where it was a, a whole thing. So I think that's, that was pretty critical, you know, to my development as a writer. And that really opened my eyes to, you know, what it's like to like actually finish something and to tell a complete story. Did you ever think about publishing a book of short stories or no, you always love the novel or novella form? Um, you know, it's funny. I haven't really written a short story since I started writing novels. I've thought about doing it, but it now seems really difficult. I'm like, wow, how could I tell a whole story in 5,000 words or something? You know, I mean, I'm, of course it can be done, but uh, I should. I really should. I haven't tried it, but I should do that and soon probably because that would probably be good for my writing. Is it harder to make a living as a screenwriter or an author? Well, one of the reasons I kind of gravitated to writing a book uh, at the time, I was sort of discouraged with my screenwriting and I figured, well, you know, writing a book seems way harder. So that means fewer people are probably doing it. You know, I figured, I don't know if that's true. Like that can totally be not true. But that was the way, what seemed logical to me at the time. And that was kind of why I kept coming back to trying to write a book. I mean, there are a lot of avenues to uh, making money through writing. I think it's hard to make a lot of money no matter what you're doing, you know. But in terms of like making some money, it's probably, I would say, easier because a book is a, is a complete thing. You know, when you finish a book, that is its ultimate destination. It is a book and you, someone can read it. Whereas a screenplay, even the greatest screenplay in the world is not complete, you know, until someone makes a movie out of it. It doesn't really stand as its own thing that you can monetize, you know at least not yet. So I think uh, I, there's probably more opportunities to make money as a, as a author, as a novelist, but it's also in some ways uh, harder work and takes longer. And I think either way to be really successful, you need a, you know, a combination of a lot of work and time and experience and luck. Well, the great thing too about novel writing is you don't need really much money to be able to do it. Sure. And, um, you know, you can also document well, people's thought process. I think that goes also for screenplays, though. I mean, you don't need money to write a screenplay. But I think, like, the problem is once you've written it, you're, you are almost certainly dependent on someone else monetizing it for you. You know, you, you know unless you're planning to produce it yourself, which is a whole other, you know, level of commitment and challenges, um, you, you can't monetize a screenplay by yourself. You know, there's really nothing you can do that I'm aware of to just start generating money from a screenplay. Like you need to have, you need to interest other people in it and then they need to option it and then they need to get a movie made and, and buy it from you and then, you know, turn it into something else. Whereas with a book, once you've got that book, like there are avenues to start monetizing it right away. You can, you don't, you can go the traditional route and try to get an agent and send it to the major publishers, but you can also publish it on uh, something like Wattpad or self-publishing through Amazon or, you know, all different avenues. And do you think that it's a, it's a, do you think this is a fallacy that people aren't reading as much? You know, there, there's people, well, newer generations, they just want to watch videos on phones, whether they're... Yeah, I don't think that's true at all. I mean, I, in fact, I think, I think people are buying less books in bookstores, but actually ebook sales and audiobook sales continue to grow uh, year over year. So clearly people are reading. I think they're just shifting the formats that they're doing it in. But I also think, you know, I think it's important to, to point out that if, you know, even in terms of books, if you want to make money from writing books, you, you do, you, I would very strongly caution people again to stay away from that lottery thinking. You're not going to write one book and become like a millionaire. You know, it's like you have to formulate a a business plan in essence it's a business you know and either a business you're running yourself or a business that you're you know working with publishers on one way or the other but it's still a business and so you need to look at you know how much are they going if you're going to a publisher they're only going to pay you a certain amount up front and then they're going to pay you in installments and if the book doesn't sell those installments aren't going to come and how many books do you want to write a year and how many books are they willing to publish a year 
if you're going to do it yourself and self-publish, like how are you going to draw eyeballs to that first book? You know, how how are you going to keep your output consistent so that the readers don't drop off while they're waiting for that next book? I mean, I I think that there's you know there's the creative challenges of writing a book, but the moment you want to start making money off of it, I do think it's important to kind of look at it a different way. You know, put on a different hat and make a plan. Like it's not just going to no one's just going to magically hand you a, a stack of money, no matter what route you go. You know, so you need to have a plan of how you're going to monetize this and turn it into a business. And even if you do get that one huge hit, especially previously in other years where it seems like people could make way more money, maybe I don't know, maybe the deals were structured differently. But it'll be, what have you done for me lately? You, yes. you'll, you won't be able to just rest on that one project. Yeah, I mean, the amount of writers, the authors that really make you know massive incomes off their writing is really small i mean it's I, i'm not saying you can't make a living you absolutely can but like you know that stephen king level money is really rare i mean even if you look at traditionally published authors most of them are not making anywhere near that you know they're making you know kind of normal salaries really you know like like you could make the same amount of money probably doing something else so you have to really you know, love this and love the process and think it through and plan, you know, and put a, save money because you can have, I've had good years and bad years with what I'm doing and not every year is equal, you know. So if you have a slow year, it's good if you have some other streams of income you can rely on or, you know, savings that you can rely on. So I just, I think when you, but more, I guess more above all that, what I want to get at is that when you do invest in that lottery thinking, I think that's when you get discouraged, you know, when it doesn't turn up that you know and you're sure this is going to be the thing and it doesn't and it doesn't catapult you into like you know being a multimillionaire i think it's really easy to kind of look at that as a failure and give up but it's a much longer process you know i think you just need to be prepared for a longer haul and look at it that way you know don't look at it like i'm going to write this book and make a billion dollars look at it, i'm going to write this book you know maybe it'll make some money and then what am i going to do after that how am i going to build that up into something else you know? I love that terminology, and I think we've been really spoiled with that, especially whether we watch MTV Cribs or, you know, from going back to, you know, Gen X or whatever. Just we're, we're taught that it, it's sort of like one and done, and, yeah. and it's so easy, and if you can just get to that level, and so much of it isn't. But even and, those people, even Stephen King, if you read his book, you know, the book that made him successful was like his fourth or fifth novel, I believe. You know, he published the others under a pseudonym. Yeah, and he'd been writing for years and he you know had sold short stories to magazines and he'd been at it since he was like 16 years old you know it, it, it I think we the media likes these instant success stories because they're glamorous and exciting and fun but even those stories if you really look there's usually a lot more work you know behind the scenes than what you're seeing and it it takes years to really achieve that kind of success I kind of think of it like um and that's why like I said before like I think I I, I upset that I let my you know self-confidence wane not because I think it I would have been amazingly successful but I just it just kept me from doing the things I should have been doing all along you know because it's a process and it takes time it's like going to the gym you know you're not going to go into the gym one day and walk out looking like Sylvester Stallone like that's everyone gets that you know that's not realistic but for some reason I think when we think of creative endeavors we think that oh we're going to do this one and it's going to be you know Star Wars or something that makes you billions of dollars and I just I'm sure maybe that's happened for like a tiny percentage of people but that's essentially betting on a lottery ticket so and I think it's much easier to kind of look at it realistically and say, okay, I'm going to write this book and it, you know, maybe it's not going to change my life, but I can realistically see it making a little bit of money. I, it'll, it'll pay back the editing costs and the cover costs and maybe give me a little bit more and then I can do the next one and I'll have more readers. And, you know, it's a career that you can build up over a few years. And if you look at it that way, you can plan intelligently rather than dump that first book out and then get upset when it's not like a bestseller right away. Yeah, and did, in on writing, Stephen King talked about he was teaching, and then he worked in a laundromat, and he, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, different odd jobs. Yeah, absolutely. And and um, even when he quote unquote made it, then he had a new set of problems. Yeah. That he also talks about, which that's its whole other ball of wax. But being alone in that room and and occupying your mind and different things that. Like yeah, you used I, to spoke of as well. Even like when people when people talk about how they wish they could just you know get paid to write. Like I said, like sometimes that's 
sometimes that's great, but sometimes it may not be what you really thought it was. You know, you might not enjoy it as much as you think you would. So, sure, everything, yeah, and everything has so many hours put into it that we never see. And, yeah, yeah. But a lot of people like the idea of things. Yeah, so, yeah, I like that million dollar idea. It's good. How does a writer figure out whether they should write screenplays or novels? Hmm. I mean, I do both, so. And I enjoy both. Like, I don't think I would want to give up one or the other. But I think that once you've, I think you need to do both to know, right? How can you know if you haven't tried? And if you've tried one and hated it, then you know, you know. But uh, I think if you like both, there's no reason why you can't do both. I, I don't think there's, I think they have similarities and differences. And like I said, I think as you get better at one, you'll find things that you can apply to the other and vice versa. And your writing will improve. What about to the writer that says, I really want to be a writer, whether it's screenplays or novels, I just don't have the time. I think that for a small percentage of the population, that could be true. But for the vast majority of people, I think that's just an excuse. I mean, we all have the same amount of time. And I wrote most of my first novel while I was fully employed. I just, you know, I just had to get up early and I would write for an hour before I went to work. You know? um, again, I think, I think the people that think that it's kind of that lottery thinking again because they're like, oh, this is going to take six months, you know, or, or I, can't, I can't just do it right away. But who cares if it takes six months? Like, so what? You know, I mean, it probably won't if you really think about it. I mean, if you wrote a thousand words a day, which I think most people could probably do in an hour, maybe two hours. So, you know, a 70, that's 70 days. That's what, two months, you know, two and a half months. You could have a book. So I don't think... I think it's certainly a daunting thing, and most people's first books take way longer than they think they will because, like you know, you you just haven't kind of worked that discipline yet. You're just not used to sitting down every day and doing it. But once you do that, you, you I think you, it's it's easier than people realize, and it you you just have to find the time. I mean, it's if it's important to you, uh, you know, watch a half hour less of TV every day. Mm -hmm. Stop surfing the news. Yeah, yeah, that's probably super helpful these days. Yeah. And it's not even, a, a, you know, I'm not saying, I don't think you have to make a drastic sacrifice. It's not like cut out all TV. I mean, of course, I still watched plenty of TV and I still do, but, you know, just a little bit less. Like, just find, find, find the time. I mean, I tried that actually. It was very freeing. This was back <laughs> uh, when reality TV was just starting. So mm. it was actually very freeing to just completely have no. Where I lived, if you didn't have cable, you couldn't watch anything, and it was just very freeing. I did. I remember when I switched to uh, streaming, like uh, I cut cable because I, I, you know, I, I was uh, watching some god awful reality show. I can't remember what it was, and I was like, <laughs> "Why am I watching this? Like, I, I'm not even interested in this remote, right. but it's just on." So for that day, I canceled cable and I just only did streaming because I was like, at least with streaming, I am choosing to watch whatever I watch. Maybe it's garbage, but I picked it. You know, whereas with cable, it's just like whatever was on next. Like you just sit there, you know, kind of zoning out. It's the same now with scrolling. Just like, yeah. why am I scrolling through this Instagram feed? Okay, stop. You know, and and it really takes a lot. Of, it's too easy to be mindless, but. Now, I mean, look, if you're a, a mom with two kids and you're working, like, I get it. I'm sure it's super hard to find sure, time. Like, absolutely. I'm sure there's people that are having trouble. But even if you can set aside 15 minutes, you know, I mean, even if you can write 200 words a day, it'll take you a while, but you'll get a book, you know. Can you talk about the opportunities that are available now that weren't available to authors previously? Yeah, I mean, I think um, right now for writers, and other kinds of artists, like almost any sort of creative person, I think there's more opportunity now than there's ever been. I mean, if you really think about it. Now, I think a lot of people are sort of used to kind of a, the traditional way where they're putting out their stuff and, and trying to sell it, you know, and that is always going to be difficult. But in terms of getting your material into people's hands, I mean, as a writer, you know, the biggest company on earth, Amazon, has enabled you to publish your books with them, you know, and and you have a potential audience of millions of people. Um, Wattpad, you know, lets you publish little short stories and, and things and, and little snippets of things, and some of those have been optioned and turned into movies. Um, YouTube, TikTok, you know, all those, you can put out short films, you can put out uh, 
little sketches. I mean, there's, I think there's constantly stories in the news about people who have made little shorts on YouTube that end up getting development deals and things. Um, so, I mean, the tools are there, you know, I mean, you, you just have to put yourself out there. I think that's the hardest part is like just deciding I'm gonna put myself out there. I mean, honestly, like I watch these YouTubers and I am blown away like by how much work they must put in. You know, I mean, these, you know, the successful ones produce content like on a daily basis, you know, or a weekly basis. And, you know, there's maybe there's implications that are negative to that, but in terms of the hard work, you know, that they're doing, I think it's pretty impressive. Like, and so I think if you're, if you really want to get your stuff out there, like there are so many avenues to do it now, like more than ever in history. Oh, and sorry, also, I think I should add too that on the business side of things, not only can you get your stuff out there, but platforms like Facebook, you can uh, run marketing and campaigns and advertise and actually build audiences. You know, I mean, the idea, 20 years ago, the idea that you could like build an audience of like 100,000 people that you know like similar authors to you and target advertisements to, to a product you have to those people, that would be unheard of. And now anyone can do that. You know, you don't have to be a business or a company like, so, I mean, again, like there's so many tools that are out there to, to create your content, put your content out there and build an audience for it. What's the most stressful part of being a professional that you had no clue until you started? Uh, I think we, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but I think the, uh, the imposter syndrome, like that, that feeling that, you know, it's not as good as before, it's not good enough. You know, I think that is a, uh, I think I just thought like, okay, well, if I can get through my first book, then everything else will be easier, you know? And uh, and actually I heard a lot of authors say that too, like, oh, the first book's the hardest. And in, and in many ways that's true, like in the terms of like the hours you put into it and learning the craft and just what it takes to produce a book when you've never done it before, it is very difficult. But I think what I found surprisingly hard, like I said, was kind of coping with that imposter syndrome afterwards. Like, I don't, maybe I'm not as good as I think I am, or maybe all these people who like it that you know they're wrong or they're not seeing all the problems with it you know or how or maybe i maybe i just can't do it again you know like like that is definitely there and i mean i think it's ultimately i think it's just your brain like psyching yourself out but i it was a lot more prevalent than i thought it would be so when you were writing the first novel or the novella maybe there was a little more sense of wow this is going great before you knew the response and then once you get a positive response sounds like it's been mostly positive, then you start doubting yourself? Yeah, it's weird, right? You would think, uh, I think for the first book, it's more like, hey, can you get this done? You know, it's like, I've never written a book before, so automatically, if I can finish a novel, that's a victory, you know? And, and I finished it, so that's a huge victory for me. Like, I was super stoked when I finished it. I didn't care if it was good or not. I was just like, wow, I finished a book, you know? And, but, and like you said, the response was largely positive, but, and I guess I thought, I never would have, or I never would have thought that you would feel like worried when you're getting a largely positive response. But I did find that when I went on to the second book, I'm like, oh man, like what if I let these people down? You know, like what if all the people who love the first one and then now they don't like this one and I let them down? You know, like I felt that really strongly. And then again on the third one and the fourth one and every book I've ever written, like there's that kind of doubt in the back of your head. You know, I think I think it's just inherent if you care about what you're doing you know i think it's inherent in the creative process and you just have to learn to kind of not listen to that voice you know i think it's always going to be there you just have to silence it until you get to the editing and then that's where i think that can actually be useful you know where you can say is this as good as it can be maybe if i tighten this dialogue maybe i need to add a scene that explains this more you know that's where i think the doubt can help but when you're just writing i think you need to kind of ignore that and just soldier on and there's so many books on getting to a certain point, but there's not really a lot of books. Or yeah, there's not a lot of like self-help books for the successful author, right? Like <laughs> it's like boo-hoo. <laughs> right, exactly. But uh, yeah, it's, it's true. I, I didn't, but, but what was funny was all the writers that said, oh, the first book is the hardest, later on then they're like, oh yeah, I feel that way too. Like I think, I think a lot of people... Either, maybe it's a kindness, they don't want to tell you. Like, like, they just want you to think like, oh, it'll be easier once you finish this book. They don't want to let you know like, oh no, it's just gonna get harder and harder like, each time. Well, and I'm a broken record with this one, but I'll say it again. Uh, Julia Cameron has this talk about, you know, 
sort of blocked writers or, or it's much easier to have people like you and gain sympathy when you're doubting yourself or but people are fearful of someone who's confident in doing well because then they have to look at themselves and say, why am I not there? Right. And then you push people away. So it's an interesting thing where you don't think you have to worry about that, but then you know it's, it's much more intimidating to be someone who's confident and is doing well and people like your work than someone who's well and they're insecure and then everybody wants it's, to gravitate to help you. Yeah, it's a different set of, of challenges, you know, there, but I think it kind of goes back to like we were saying, like it's not like you're going to do something and all of a sudden your whole life is easy street. You know, it's like certain things might be easier, but other things might be harder. How did your first book hit number one on Amazon? So the, the way the, the sales kind of went for me was the, uh, I released Devil's Due first and I didn't even have, I didn't really care how it did, you know, and it was, it was, I was, I was giving it away for free anyway. Um, I did put it up on Amazon as well. Um, but my real point of that book was to start building an audience, you know, for the next one. And the next, so then when I launched Tokyo Black, which was the first novel, it did well, but not, you know, not like I can live off of this well, but I was happy because it was my first book and it did well. I mean, it certainly made, you know, real money that was useful. And more importantly, people really liked it. Um, my, the second novel, Red Phoenix, that was the one that really took off, like where, um, and I couldn't tell you why. I mean, I, people have asked me, you know, I think part of it was that kind of slow process of building the audience with each book. Um, and I did, you know, like I said, I was running ads and I'd started, started to learn about marketing and I was using Facebook and, uh, other, you know, promotion sites for books and things. And, and I was, I was another, you know, I wasn't, I was working at the time and another advantage of working while you're writing is you do have more capital to invest, you know, into what you're doing. And I was able to invest a fair amount into advertising, but that book, Red Phoenix, for whatever reason, just skyrocketed. And I remember one day. I was post-supervising on a TV show and a movie simultaneously. I was freelance, so sometimes I would work multiple jobs. And I, you know, I left my house and, and I looked at my sales numbers like, oh, they're looking pretty good today. And I kind of figured that would sort of peak, you know, or it would go a little bit higher. And then I got to work and, you know, an hour later I looked again and it was like way higher, you know, when I left and I was like, whoa. And then over the course of that week, I was making more money off the book than both of those post souping jobs combined. And I was like, wow. oh, wow. And that was when I was like, okay, I could really do this, you know? How cool. Um, so that was sort of the trajectory it took. What a, was that a fantastic feeling or was that scary in the sense that, oh, is this going to last? It was, I mean, you know, I guess because I didn't expect it to last. So, I mean, I even I, because I hadn't experienced that yet, you know, so to me, I was like, OK, well, this must be a crazy day, you know, but then the next day it was just as high and the next day it was just as high. Um, but I will say that. Every author who goes through those spikes, I think, will tell you that I think the more important thing to realize is eventually they they don't last. You know, I mean, it's not sustainable to do that forever. You know, I couldn't say why it spiked the way it did, but I did, I do think because I had not gone through that experience before, I kind of thought, oh, this is the way it will always be. You know, after like a month of it being like that, I was like, I guess this is the way it is, but it's not. You know, I mean, the next book did really well, but not that well. You know, um, you will have spikes and, and ups and downs and good years and bad years. So again, that's why I say it's really important to kind of have a, a plan <clears throat> and to look at it long haul. Don't, when you do have a spike like that, it's great. Like be happy, embrace it, but don't like then build your whole career plan off of that, you know, because it's just inevitable that, you know, readers come, readers go, different genres are hot. You know, maybe, maybe China was big in the news when I launched that book or something. I don't know. But, you know, for whatever reason, that one probably to this day, I think, did the best out of all of them. Red Phoenix? Yeah, Red Phoenix. Interesting. And, what and, I, and I don't think a lot of people are like, oh, well, do you think that's your best book? And although it is actually my personal favorite, I don't think that's why. Because most people buying it, they haven't read it yet. You know, so they're just going off of the reviews and all of the books have good reviews. So... I think it's, you know, I think that I'm very happy for the success it had. It was, it really helped my life out a lot, obviously. Um, but I think it's more important to sort of build a consistent, you know, career. It's something that you can sustain. Did it have more reviews? No. Um, 
the books tend to have the re the way the reviews tend to go is obviously the longer a book's been out, the more review it reviews it has. <coughs> so I think uh, Tokyo Black has the most reviews of all of them. Red followed by Red Phoenix, followed by Fire and Forget, which is book number three. Um, I, the Devil's Due, which is the novella, doesn't have as many, but I think that's because uh, because a lot of it gets given away, you know, for free. So those people can't review it on Amazon because they didn't buy it. What does it mean to be an international bestseller? For me, like there's no direct, uh, I don't think there's any specific qualification, uh, but for me, I didn't want to use a term like that unless I could back it up. Um, I hit the bestseller lists on Amazon, you know, for my category, which are, you know, various kinds of, there's various categories on Amazon, so I tend to show up in categories like spy thriller, assassin thrillers, political thrillers, those kinds of categories. And I hit number one, more than, so Amazon will award you a bestseller tag if you hit number one and stay there for a certain amount of time. I don't know if anyone knows how long it is. Maybe there's a set amount of time. I have a feeling it's probably dependent on the market and how many books Amazon is selling at the time. But just because you hit number one doesn't mean you get that tag. You have to hit number one and stay there for a certain amount of time. And so when my books had hit number one and gotten that tag in multiple countries, that was when I just... I was like, well, I guess I'm an international best-selling author. So, and so, that was for Red Phoenix. Uh, no, that was for um, let's see, Tokyo Black hit the bestsellers list in Canada, and uh, Cold Kill, I believe, hit the bestseller list in America. Another book called Depth Charge, which is one I co-wrote, that also hit the bestseller list in America. And the uh, the box set of the first three books that also uh, got the when I say hit the bestseller list I mean it earned the Amazon bestseller tag. Tag. Um, Interesting. So and so, America, Australia, U.S. Uh, Canada, America, Australia. Those were the three territories where I, I got it. So. What amount of time did that take to happen? Um, it was over the course of years. I mean, for sure, it wasn't all at once because those books were released at different times. Um, yeah, I, I was kind of like, I didn't really think about it. You know, I, I, I was super stoked, you know, to get those bestseller tags, of course. But at the end of the day, they don't mean as much, you know, I mean, it, they draw the reader's eye to the book. And of course, they're indicative of success. But like I said, for example, Red Phoenix, which was by far my most successful book, did not earn, you know, one of those tags. It, it, for whatever reason, like, you know, maybe it was number two in its category. I don't know. But um, but that book was my most, you know, financially successful and it didn't earn it. So, I mean, I, I don't think, I wouldn't really like advise like chasing things like that. And I, I mean, sure, they're nice when they happen and of course they can be beneficial, but I don't think they're as beneficial as people think. You know, I've, I've heard a lot of interviews with uh, su really successful self-published authors, like, you know, people that are making like millions at it. And they've, they've kind of done uh, analyses over, uh, you know, how much of a sales bump do you get when you're the New York Times bestseller versus, you know, just being a successful book. And it's not as much as you would think, you know. So I certainly wouldn't let that hold you back, you know, b being afraid, oh, I'm not going to hit the bestseller list. I, it, I don't think it's as important as people believe it is. Maybe you'd be recommended in search more? Yeah, it's possible. Like I said, I'm sure it helps a little. But if you don't hit it, that does not mean your book is a failure. Sure. Do you ever go on Goodreads and, and as an author and I see sometimes authors interacting and do you ever? I do. I, not as much as I used to, mostly because I find my readers don't use it as much. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's there and I do use it. And some, I think certain communities are much more active. Like I definitely think the romance community is super active on there. So you kind of got to go where your readers are. Um, I do have my own Facebook group, so I communicate with readers there. Um, you know. There's all different avenues. Your goal with Tokyo Black was to make millions and retire on a beach somewhere? <laughs> I don't know. Isn't that what every writer tells himself, right? No. I Maybe I said that in an interview as a joke, but my goal was definitely to uh, finish it, you know, finish a book. And then when I published it, I just wanted people to enjoy it. You know, I really wanted people, like I said, I wanted people to feel like they had gone to Japan, you know, or feel like they'd experienced that and, and to, you know, be excited and it's an, it's an action book. So of course I wanted people to get pumped. And I remember, I remember when the reviews for Tokyo Black started coming in, you know, that was really nerve wracking actually. 
and this is sort of part of the process. So with, with reviews on Amazon, you sort of need to kind of jumpstart it a little bit because, you know, probably only about 1% of people that read your book are going to leave a review. You know, the, it's not a high percentage of people that go back and do that. So what you do is you, uh, you build up a review team of advanced readers where you're like, okay, you know, uh, people who have joined your list, like I said, you build that mailing list. And then you say, hey, um, you know, my book is going to launch on this day. Here's an advanced copy. Can you please leave your honest review, whether you like it, whether you don't like it, whatever you think, you know, just leave it on Amazon, you know, on, the, on this day, you know. Um, so you, you kind of know when the reviews are going to start to come in because you've told everybody. And I remember I was, I hadn't, you know, I hadn't gone through that because with Devil's Due, the, I, there was no review team. Like I, that was the first thing I launched. I didn't have a mailing list or anything. I was building it. So I, and I hadn't really thought about that. And then when I launched Tokyo Black and then the launch day came, I was like, oh my God, like I'm going to get reviews. You know, like what if people don't like it? You know, like, and I remember the, reading the reviews as they were coming in and they were so like just exactly what I had hoped they would be. And I don't just mean good reviews. I mean that people commented specifically about the setting and about feeling like they had taken a trip to Japan. Um, and I remember this one woman wrote, you know, I've traveled all over the world, but I've never been to Japan. And now that I've read this book, I'm planning my next trip there. Oh, and that meant a lot to me, you know, because I had really loved Japan. And I really wanted to communicate that to people. And I, I remember I was in the office. We were in a, a different place than we're living now, but I had this office and I like grabbed my dog. and I was like rolling around on the floor because <laughs> I was so happy with that one review, like just because it was you know, it was exactly what I had hoped people would, the way I hoped they would respond. Right. That's great. You had connected the reader. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had any meetings with Hollywood producers on turning the book into a film television show? I have. Um, you know, there are, are uh, at multiple points in time, uh, producers have contacted me. Um, you know, some of those options fell through, but there is a team of producers now that I'm working with. Um, that are, you know, they've commissioned a pilot script. I, I chose not to write it. They asked if I wanted to, but I felt like I was too close, you know, to the material as a book. So I thought it would be better to get someone else's take on it. Um, and we'll see. I mean, it's, yeah, I, it's in progress. So to be continued. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I don't know how much you can actually talk about it, but I, I mean, I can talk about it, but it's, uh, I don't, because I didn't write, I don't know a ton about what's involved with it, but I mean, I know that um, you know, they're talking to some, they're, they're exploring both movie and TV series. They're talking to some showrunners that have, you know, pretty impressive credits. But I also know that uh, that's a long road. You know, I mean, I, I there are best-selling New York Times authors that have not yet had their, you know, had their books option that have not yet been turned into series. So, I mean, I, I try not to get too involved in that. I don't want to, like, hold out on that, you know, I focus more on the books and the things I am more directly involved in. But yeah, absolutely, there's a lot of progress being made and I'm pretty excited to see where it turns up. Was that a difficult decision to make, to say, I don't want to do the screenplay? No, it wasn't hard at all. I, I you know, it's funny. Um, the producer was really surprised, but I just felt like, I mean, you know, I, I've spent years writing those books, you know, and so, and I, and I know, as a screenwriter, I know that to adapt a book, you have to be able to diverge from it where necessary. And I think it would have just been so hard for me to see it in a different way, you know, and I'm so involved. I mean, there's, you know, there's not a day that goes by where I'm not thinking about Kane and his world and the next book, you know, and next story, um, even even in between books, you know, when I'm planning the next one. I just thought it would, I wouldn't be able to to give myself the flexibility, you know, that you need to do a good adaptation. Now, maybe, you know, down the road, I'll, I'll change my mind and step in or something. But I thought it would, I thought it would, was their best bet to like start with a fresh writer. Did you ever get to meet the writer? Yeah, I did. Oh, you did? I okay. Did. Yeah, did you have lunch with them and kind of like talk about mm -hmm. the essence of Cain and, oh, okay. Yeah, and he did a great uh, pilot script for, a, he, uh, he was working on the TV show side of it and he did a pilot script and it, it's, I've read it, it's good. Wow. Okay. I'm excited. How was that to have someone else adapt your work? It's interesting. <laughs> it's really fascinating, you know, the, the, the ways that it's similar and the ways that it's different. Um, and, uh, you know, I was sort of hesitant. I didn't want to, you know, I was like, well, do you really want me to give notes? And they're like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, okay, well, I don't think Kane would do this, you know, or, 
you know, I like this a lot, but I would tweak it this way, you know. I, they're not obligated to follow my notes. It's just, you know, this is just my opinion. You know? But I, I will say that, you know, through, again, like I mentioned, you never know where these different projects are going to take you because through meeting these producers and through, uh, you know, meeting manager, you know, I signed a manager based on these people that I was working with. And in one of the conversations about Kane, uh, the producer who was, talking to the manager, he, the producer is a friend of mine, he said, oh, you know, and Andrew also has this really cool horror script. And the manager was like, oh, I, I think I could sell that. And it and it led to a whole different, you know, avenue. And that script is now optioned and set up and it looks like it's going to happen. So, I mean, again, you just, you never know like what your route is going to be. And that's why I think it's good to explore all different, you know, kinds of writing and have lots of different irons in the fire. and. and don't be afraid if something, if one thing isn't working or it's not advancing, move over to something else or try, try your hand at this or, you know, push this for a little while and see where it gets you because you just never know. Right. So this, this DIY route can actually eventually lead to a quote unquote gatekeeper. Absol green yeah, exactly. Yeah. I never thought of it that way, but it's, yeah, that is a good way to look at it. You know, until you get your material out there, you can't do anything with it. You know, I mean, you need to show that audiences respond to your work and you need to see for yourself how audiences respond to your work. And then once you do, who knows where that'll take you or who might get interested or what, you know, what opportunities that might lead to.